Hello, welcome to my Civ 5 tier list. In this video, I will rank all civs in the game, separating them from E tier to S tier. Civs will be ranked according to how many points they can get in different categories I have laid out. There are 5 out of 5 points for each of the victory types, so 5 out of 5 for military, 5 out of 5 for science, 5 out of 5 for diplomacy, and 5 out of 5 for culture. This may be controversial because not all victory types are created equal, and that it is not necessarily just as easy to achieve science as it is culture, for example. However, a Civ can still have bonuses to getting a culture victory, even if that victory is harder to get than a science victory, so I somehow needed to represent that. Ultimately, I decided to go with 5 out of 5 for each, because it's hard to determine which one is easier to achieve than the other. I give the Civs 20 out of 20 for adaptability. This section was written after I wrote most of the script for this video, and you may notice in the video how I refer to this criteria by several different names. I may call it adaptability, versatility, or flexibility. In essence, a sieve that gives the players more options in the most amount of circumstances is what I am ranking here. A sieve that must only be good if a few things go your way, say France, who needs to build certain wonders in the capital, is not very adaptable to bad scenarios. Civ 5 is a pseudo luck-based game, and that each time it's random and you need to adapt to your surroundings to overcome players. I like to compare this to games like Fortnite, where you can kind of tell what's going to happen each game, but each time you play it's different and requires you to be on your toes. Some civs help you in more scenarios than others. Points are given both on how I feel how easy it is to adapt, and how many scenarios they can adapt to. I give the civs 10 out of 10 points for best impact. What I mean by this is, if every one of their abilities and units and all that comes into play, how impactful is it? This score is given in consideration to other civs, so it's impossible for all civs to have 10 out of 10. Ideally, since there are 43 civs in the game, each section of this, so 1 out of 10, 2 out of 10, 3 out of 10, etc., would have 4 or 5 civs each. By impact, I mean how much of the state of the game does the civs bonuses change? How much does it help you? How counterable is it? Is there anything that can be done to stop you from making your impact? I give the civs 10 out of 10 for miscellaneous. This is for any points I feel that did not get a mention. Basically, if I feel there is something worth mentioning, but it didn't fall into any of the other categories, I'll put it here. The tier ranking is as follows for what you see on screen. Each civ, at worst, can get 7 out of 60 points for getting 1 out of whatever for each category, so getting E tier is pretty rare. E tier is for civs who will have negligible or even bad bonuses. D tier has good bonuses, but not as good as C tier, who is not as good as B, etc. The order I did these civs in was completely random, I used random.org. And lastly, what you see on screen are the settings I like to play the game in. It, this tier list is pretty ambiguous, it can be for whatever settings you want. In general, I think Pangea is the best map, although sometimes I will do continents, and I always do epic speed. Babylon is a science-focused Civ, which is a great thing since every aspect of Civ 5 is locked behind science. You will find in this video that the more a Civ helps to science, the more it helps to everything. Science is all-powerful in this game. Babylon has a unique unit, the Bowman, which replaces the Archer. This replacement gives it stats similar to the composite Bowman while being available at archery. In the early game, not much warfare happens unless you're facing a particularly violent Civ such as the Zulu or Greece. In the scenario you are facing one of those civs, the bowman is great since it allows you to defend yourself relatively easily while also allowing you to explore the upper part of the tech tree where philosophy is. Because of this, you do not have to worry about getting some of the bottom techs to defend yourself since the bowman can do it better than the archer can. However, composite bowmen are technically better than the bowman, and it is not particularly hard to get a composite bow anyways, so while it helps, it doesn't do a whole lot. Archers are also one of the worst units in the game, and a replacement for them is not much different. Secondly are the Walls of Babylon, which form a similar role to the Bowmen, but I think do it a lot better. Basically, these walls defend your city far better than normal walls would. The difference is extremely substantial and it makes Babylon much harder to invade, especially in the early game. Because these walls help you defend so much, a one-time investment of these walls could save you lots of production where you may instead be making units if you did not have access to the walls. Also, if you capture a city and it has walls, they will turn into Walls of Babylon, which will help you defend the city from being reclaimed. Finally is Babylon's ability, Ingenuity. 
This ability gives Babylon a free scientist when the player discovers writing, and also generates scientists more quickly. This is one of the best abilities in the game, as it allows you to basically double your science in the early game, and thus double the speed at which you research text. By rushing writing, you can actually sometimes discover text faster than others may have been rushing for, such as currency or engineering, because this scientist helps you so much. Basically, this one scientist lets you customize the early game very heavily. More often than not, Babylon players go straight into education and also try to build the great library so they can start generating scientists faster. Good Civ 5 players will always be spending all they can on science to get ahead of their competitors, and Babylon lets you do so with ease. Overall, Babylon gets a 5 out of 5 for culture, 5 out of 5 for war, 5 out of 5 for science, and a 5 out of 5 for diplomacy. Direct bonuses to science help greatly with all of these aspects, but Babylon actually has little incentive to spend its time with city-states. That being said, the first two in ideology means Babylon could easily obtain city-state allies anyways. This is the same for culture victories, since Babylon should be the first to any of the ideologies. Babylon gets 18 out of 20 for adaptability, and 10 out of 10 for impact. Babylon, rather than helping with the aspects that go towards science and Civ 5, instead just gives you the science straight up. This is good, but Badland is still Badland, and Babylon can't do anything about that. They do have a good start bias, which is avoid Tundra, as Tundra is some of the worst land in the game. Finally, Babylon gets a 10 out of 10 for Miscellaneous, since the scientist really opens up a lot of opportunities for Babylon. The scientists and the walls really let Babylon play tall or wide, and play aggressive or passive. Babylon lends a spot in S tier with a total of 58 out of 60. Ethiopia, while not apparent at first, is a very good sieve. They're extremely flexible and can be great at offense, defense, or whatever. Ethiopia does not have direct benefits to science compared to Babylon, but it has things that can, in a few scenarios, put it ahead of Babylon. First off, and probably the least relevant, is Ethiopia's ability, Spirit of Adwa. Simply put, if your enemy has more cities than you, you get a plus 20% combat bonus against them. This implies that Ethiopia should be tall, and while that is true, do not underestimate wide Ethiopia. This ability is great if A. You are tall and an empire attacks you, or B. There is a runaway civ with a lot of land that you need to attack. Because playing tall is so viable, case A is bound to happen sometime, and case B is a great benefit to something where you have, like, Shaka or the Huns in your game. It is the least impactful of Ethiopia's abilities, but it's still a pretty good one. Ethiopia's most impactful aspect is their building, the Steli. This replaces the monument and gives two faith. That is absolutely insane, and it really does not seem that way. Ethiopia gets first pantheon, second only to the Celts, and often gets first religion always. This ties extremely well with tradition's free culture building policy, but also makes going wide incredibly versatile. Faith in this game scales linearly, so the amount of cities you have does not change how effective your faith per city is, unlike culture or science, so having lots of cities is good. Having lots of faith is very meta-defining for a few reasons. Your religion will get you a founder belief the more widespread it is. City-state influence to grid slower with shared religions. You can save up faith for great people at the end of the game. And you can buy buildings like pagodas and get plus two happiness per city for building a monument that you were going to have anyways. Faith and going wide go hand in hand in this game, and the steli really opens up lots of options for Ethiopia as a result. It's excellent with tradition, excellent with liberty, Ties well with piety, ties well with patronage, ties well with commerce, you name it. You can avoid researching pottery and avoid piety since you have faith off the bat and can instead dip your toes into other playstyles that players wish they could do. Lastly, Ethiopia has the Mehel Safari. This replaces the Rifleman. The Rifle is not a particularly useful unit. It comes at a less than ideal technology and also gets replaced by Great War Infantry rather quickly. However, this Rifleman does something that really makes it worth, and that is that it starts with Drill. Any unit in this game that starts with a promotion is great, because it means you can stack benefits right out the gate, which normally would require something like Brandenburg Gate to do. With a Barracks and an Armory, both of which are on the way to Rifles, you can get units coming out with two cover promotions. Melee units are idealistically indestructible to ranged attacks, as your artillery do the damage and the rifles do the blocking, so double cover off the bat is excellent. Alternatively, you can get triple drill off the bat, and get extremely powerful units that can one-shot most things in rough terrain. The latter is a bit more risky, but it can pay off. This unit also has a bonus that scales with how far away you are from the capital, 
and that is a plus 30% combat bonus. At around 10 tiles or so, it becomes more like a plus 10% combat bonus, which is nice, but less impactful than the drill bonus. Ideally, enemy units will not be in your capital, but if for some reason your capital is on the board of another sieve, this is a highly impactful bonus. Typically, it does not come into effect, so bank on it purely for defensive purposes. This unit also costs 12% less production, which is nice. Ethiopia is great, and it's all to the steli. I give them 5 out of 5 for diplomacy, 3 out of 5 for culture, 4 out of 5 for science, and a 5 out of 5 for military. Faith, in general, translates to money the most, but can translate to science at the end of the game, hence why diplomacy is the highest ranking. I give them a 18 out of 20 for adaptability. The early game benefits really help overcome almost any start. The only non-adaptable side to them is you perform far better if you're actively playing religiously, so you don't really get a choice for how you play. They get a 9 out of 10 for impact, as the steli comes out instantly and starts easily opening up snowball potential. Lastly, I give Ethiopia a 9 out of 10 for miscellaneous, since their ability and unit can decimate armies in many scenarios, and the steli is just so versatile. Ethiopia gets a 53 out of 60 in S tier. Denmark only has direct, measurable benefits to war. A lot of people think these benefits are not good, but I'm not sure about that. I do think there are better war benefits, but Denmark works like Carthage, where Denmark players can find really unique strategies. Denmark has the ability Viking Fury, which does a handful of things. Embarked units gain an extra movement point, and only use one movement point from going to sea to land. Melee units also pay no movement cost to pillage, Embarking units during a war is almost always a no-go, but with Denmark, I actually really like the concept. Since embarked units have plus one move and only use one movement point to go from sea to land, a unit on the coast can immediately hop in and start harassing the enemy with no issue. That is easier said than done, however, and more often than not, you'll either not be attacking with your units from the coast, or will not have extra movement points for them to use. In the later game, when embarked units gain extra movement points, this actually becomes really helpful because they keep those movement points when they get on land, so you can have artillery on land that have like three moves or so remaining. These circumstances almost never happen though, and while they make war easier, they're not going to be winning the war that you would have already won anyways. Claiming a city, maybe 5 turns versus 20 or 30. But I found that the Danes are very fast when warring civ to civ, which is what you do late game, but at every point in the game instead of just the late game. They also have some unique units, the first of which is the Norwegian Ski Infantry, which replaces the Rifle. The Rifle is an alright unit to build, but it just comes at a point where the player really needs to start building factories and public schools. Because of this, it often comes later than expected, and is also very quickly replaced. Players may rush for rifling tech, however, if they think it is more worth it than to build a public school. Does the Norwegian Ski Infantry make it worth it? No. This unit has combat bonuses on snow, tundra, and hills, as long as there's no forest or jungle on the tile, and they can also move in these tiles with the quickness, just like how the Inca do. The combat bonus is basically meaningless, so you can disregard that. It's a small bonus and happens so rarely that it doesn't matter. The only time you may see it is if you're attacking an enemy on a mine. As for the movement, it's not that bad, but it's just not useful on infantry in particular, since you could just build cavalry if you wanted fast units. Cavalry also come with Brandenburg Gate, which is something you might actually want to tech for, unlike rifles. The bonus does stay with the upgrades, but it's very expensive to upgrade the unit from a rifle to a great four, and then to an infantry, which makes it really questionably worth it. However, the movement does apply to hills covered in forests, while the combat bonus does not. Ultimately, pass unless you have plenty of money to upgrade it into a more useful unit that can use the benefit. Positioning is key with melee units, so it actually is rather helpful to have them move faster, but positioning matters less in the late game when you have things with like 3 or 4 range. An infantry with this ability is not bad, but just really not worth the money. Next up is the Berserker. This unit has extra movement, is cheaper to produce, comes at an earlier tech, comes with the Amphibious promotion, and is a bit weaker than its replacement, the Longswordsman. Longswordsmen in general are contenders for the worst units in the game, since they are expensive, come late, and quickly outclassed by musketmen. The Berserker, however, comes at a very obtainable tech and is cheaper to produce. The Amphibious Promotion is also a nice touch. 
I find that this unit is excellent, and that is largely due to when it comes out, and the movement. Spamming with berserkers who are stronger than pikemen, but not too many more hammers is so much fun, and with drill upgrades, they can ignore downsides to basically all terrain they attack into. When muskets come around, it is also worth it to avoid the musket tech, so you can keep producing these super cheap units. I find it very comparable to surg rushing. I am usually not a fan of medieval warfare, I find it stally and very hard to conquer someone with defensive terrain, but the berserker really removes those aspects. A city or two making berserkers and another making crossbows will overwhelm the enemy and there's nothing they can do in the long run. Denmark gets a 2 out of 5 for culture, a 1 out of 5 for diplomacy, a 1 out of 5 for science, and a 3 out of 5 for military. If you are berserker spamming, you're not using resources on great writers and artists, so it is easier to win a tourism victory with a futurism policy from autocracy. That is extremely niche though, but it works quite well. Futurism can at least let you choose autocracy with no dissidents if pulled off correctly. Denmark's military bonuses are nice, but the two units come at points where you should be building other things, and one of the units is basically useless anyways. The ability is nice to land some cheap, unexpected hits, but will likely never land you anything you could not do in the first place, and will just make it a bit easier. But that's not a bad thing, since any kind of time save in Civ 5 is a good one. Denmark gets a 6 out of 20 for adaptability, and a 4 out of 10 for their impact. Lastly, they get an 8 out of 10 for miscellaneous, since the embarking can lead to fun strategies that otherwise would not be possible, landing them in the C tier with a total of 25 out of 60. Denmark is not terrible, and I would claim is painfully average. I was just not really impressed by the ability to put them any higher, but they may have a lot of untapped potential. Berserkers can upgrade into Norwegian ski infantry, lending them the two promotions that come with each unit, but that is expensive and unrealistic most of the time. A berserker to a musket to a ski infantry to a great war to an infantry is almost 1,000 gold, and there's also the maintenance. The way I play the game, I personally do not have that kind of money for just an okay unit, let alone multiple copies of it. Denmark also fares better on continents maps, by the way. Arabia tends to have no direct benefits to things you want, but the benefits it does have to everything else more than make up for it. To fully utilize Arabia, you need a pinch of luck, but Arabia gives players a couple options for how to play them and how to overcome bad luck. First up is the Camel Archer. In Civ 5, there are several unique units across all civs that are meant to be kind of a nice twist on the unit that it replaces that reflects the civ in history. At that point in history, the Civ's unique unit really provided something. In the classroom, I never heard of Camel Archers, and I'm unsure why because this unit is probably the best unique unit in the game. I don't think many things are OP in this game, but the Camel Archer definitely is. It has increased physical strength and also has a very strong ranged attack. It also can be upgraded from Horse Archers, so Horse Archers can keep their ranged upgrades when going to Camel Archers. It is expensive to upgrade them, however. In the medieval era, it's not unheard of to see logistics or march on camel archers. A camel archer is single-handedly a great defensive unit, a war and menace, and a fantastic hit-and-run type of unit. Much like the Keshik, the camel archer can attack and move, meaning they can take out cities and units with no damage. Not that that matters, because they have so much defense anyways. Camel archers can save you in a pinch, and can also stomp rampaging enemies. They also put up a long fight, and are still relevant even in the industrial era. The Bazaar, which more so determines Arabia's long-term playstyle, is a market replacement. In cities with a Bazaar, you are granted double copies of each luxury resource, so in a city with three silk, you get six silk. Since the player only needs one silk for the happiness, they can sell the other five for more happiness or more gold. This allows Arabia to be very versatile, either having golden ages for days due to the increased happiness, a powerful military since the upkeep matters less, or a huge surplus of gold for the future game. Gold is essential for winning diplomatic victories, and Arabia can often accumulate 10 or 20,000 gold by turtling. You can use this surplus to either buy city-states or to buy important buildings like research labs instantly. Arabia's ability is an interesting one, where it's just kind of a couple things that don't have much synergy but still work well. The first part is that caravans get extra range. This is a bit unfortunate that it only applies to caravans, since caravans are inferior to cargo ships in every way, and it also is not really important since most of your caravans should be going to your own cities to grow them anyways. This has a niche use with culture victories to get the criteria 
has trade route between sieves if the sieve is really far away and you don't have any coastal trade routes with them. The next ability is trade routes, so not just caravans, spread the religion of a city it leaves twice as well. This is a nice touch, but nothing game changing. You can get pressure that is often 40 or 50 plus with some trade routes, but that is assuming you can get a good religion in the first place. Arabia spawns in the desert, and that means that they have the potential for desert faith. If you spawn in a desert, and get desert faith, and get something good like tithe, then it is worth it to make this the focus of your play to get tons of gold. Otherwise, it isn't too important. Finally, Arabia has its oil resources doubled, which I find is never really important. Since Arabia spawns in the desert, there's plenty of oil to go around anyways. The only use for this is if you discover oil before the AI, and then sell them the oil you have extras of. Overall, Arabia is an excellent sieve, mostly due to the Camel Archer. Outside of that, it has some ways to accumulate money, which is not crazy important, but still nice to have. Arabia gets a 5 out of 5 for Diplomacy, a 3 out of 5 for Culture, a 3 out of 5 for Science, and a 4 out of 5 for Military. Arabia gets a 9 out of 10 for Impact, and a 16 out of 20 for Versatility. Lastly, because Faith and Money are ambiguous, they get a nice 10 out of 10 for Miscellaneous. That leaves Arabia with a total of 50 out of 60 and puts them at the very top of A tier. Germany has a lot of things that really do not have synergy with each other. I can say that they're all situationally very relevant and those situations are bound to happen at some point within a game. These benefits are not too consistent however, so it's in the player's hands to force these benefits to happen which makes them kind of seem like not benefits. There's more than meets the eye, however. Germany's ability is Foro Teutonicus. Upon defeating a barbarian encampment, there is a two-thirds chance that Germany will claim the barbarian that last inhabited it as their own and get lower gold than normal. Germany also has 25% less maintenance for land units. The maintenance is actually very nice and builds up to a nice sum of change at the end of the game, but it is not really a thing you can plan the game around and is instead just a nice little passive bonus. The barbarian part of the ability is one I personally am not a fan of, but if luck is on your side and the situation calls for it, getting a unit for free can be great. This happens less often than you would think. Some players may take it upon themselves to go barb hunting and build an early army, which is a legitimate strategy. This way, if defense is a concern, you can still spend time on your libraries and such, but at the end of the day, it's not something that will make or break a game, but it's something that might determine how far behind you are other players. This ability, however, I find is really useful late game when barb camps have infantry and machine guns inside of them. Having a strong unit pop up for free is a great thing in any war, and especially at the end of the game when so many of the units are OP, but, like before, it will help but won't determine anything in the long run. Germany has the Panzer, a tank replacement. The tank is not a very key military unit usually, and the Panzer has the unfortunate drawback of being a replacement for a so-so unit. The benefits, however, do outweigh the tank and I think make it worth. The Panzer is stronger and has extra movement, which makes it a great kind of hit-and-run or steamrolling unit. Lake Amor is very fast, you can take city after city in a matter of a few turns, and the Panzer synergizes very well with planes. The Panzer does not do anything you could not do before, but makes it a bit easier. At the end of the day though, you're probably going to end up having infantry or mobile stamps with rocket artillery, which are better because they do not require oil, which the planes need and the infantry can fortify. Melee units are much better at defending than attacking, so being able to fortify is a big deal. Finally, Germany has the Hans, which replaces the bank. Banks are actually something you can prioritize, as the Renaissance does not have any key buildings like public schools, so your production is your oyster. The Hans gives the city plus 5% production for each trade route your civilization as a whole has with the city-state. With no extra trade routes from Wonders, Germany can get 40% extra production in all cities with the Hans, which is very, very good. Liberty players may find Germany as something of interest, as Germany does very well with lots of cities, unlike most civs. If the Hans is used correctly, late game military can be spammed like no tomorrow, and since you have banks and maxed out trade routes, you'll probably not be running much of a deficit, especially due to Germany's ability. If you cannot get the Hans up and running, however, Germany is an objectively bad civ. Make sure Embargo City States does not get passed, otherwise you have no unique building. With Petra and other trade route wonders, Germany can get 50% extra production in all cities, which makes an absolute powerhouse. Late game production does not matter to Germany and they can spam out whatever they want whenever they want. It makes the space race the epitome of a race, if you will. Germany gets a 4 out of 5 for military, a 2 out of 5 for culture, 
a 3 out of 5 for diplomacy, and a 3 out of 5 for science. In order to get the Hans up and running, you do not have as much time as you would normally would to build Renaissance wonders, so it makes accumulating culture a bit harder than you might expect. Germany's a great futurism sieve if you're able to choose autocracy without having unrest. Germany gets a 5 out of 10 for impact. Germany, I think, is best as a military sieve, and while it has a unique approach to it, it only has one bonus that really helps it get to where it needs to be. Germany gets a 12 out of 20 for adaptability, since having extra production can help with literally anything. Lastly, Germany gets a nice 5 out of 10 for miscellaneous. This gives them a total of 34 out of 60, lemming them in B tier. Compared to Denmark, with the cheap berserker, Germany can do the same thing with every unit after 4 or 5 trade routes. The Maya, in my opinion, are the most versatile sieve in the game, and can play basically any kind of playstyle you can think of effectively. They also happen to be my favorite sieve, and I was hooked on them when I first started playing this game in 2013. The Maya being so versatile really spice up the gameplay, and you can have a completely different game depending on how you decide to use their bonuses. So let's go over two of them, which are two game-changing bonuses, and one that's just okay. The first is the Atlatlist, which replaces the Archer. The draw of the Atlatlist is that it does not need archery research to build it, and is available straight from the get-go. This synergizes with my preferred and I also think best strategy to play the Maya, but it can also do a few other things. So first off, avoiding researching archery can be a nice thing if you do not need it or the wheel researched, so you can go straight into writing and calendar. The Atlatlist saves early game beakers that way. Secondly, Zerg rushing with the Atlatlist is very real, and can be a kind of hunnic strategy with battering rams. Archers and Atlatlists are not particularly strong, so you'll have to take a gamble by immediately building them before they fall off. Otherwise, if you do it too late, after you've scouted the land and met your neighbors, you'll have made 5 or 6 archers that don't do enough damage and they die in one hit. I would say avoid this unless you have a terrible start and need to conquer someone else ASAP, or you have great production and no growth. Thirdly, the Maya can flirt with the honor policy tree by using its opener to find barbarian camps and then kill them easily with atlat lists. After enough barbs, the policy will pay for itself, but will need constant attention from the players to make it effective over the tradition opener, which gives the player constant culture in the first place. Some players may open tradition and then honor, and then finish tradition, and this can get you your aqueducts faster if you kill a lot of barbarians. Like, a lot. All of these strategies that the Atlas fill, however, are not exactly incredible, and are just mostly fun little gimmicks. At the end of the day, archers are weak, and so is the Atlas. It gets outclassed by the composite bow almost instantly, and does not get strength like the Babylon Bowman. But these last two strategies are not what the Atlas is for, it is so they can defend you while researching, so use it for that. Having the option is still nice regardless. The Maya's ability, the Long Count, is one of the coolest abilities in the game. At the end of each Mayan calendar cycle, which is going off of the in-game year counter at the top of the screen, the Maya get a free great person of their choice if theology is researched. It happens roughly every 394 years. This is a great ability because you can get lots of great people very early since years pass more quickly earlier on than later. Early game years go from like 1000 BC to 900 to 800, so 394 years happen very quickly. The Maya can get a scientist and an engineer in just a few turns from each other for doing nothing but researching what you wanted to anyways. Theology is also a tech most players want because it unlocks education which has universities and comes right after the national college tech. So in conjunction with the Atlatlist, the player can research writing, build a library, research philosophy, build a national college, and then research theology and get a free scientist in the matter of 100 turns. The downside of this is that you do not settle cities till after you normally would, but I think the science makes up for it. If you decide to avoid building the National College immediately, however, you can still get a scientist, or an engineer, or a prophet to get an early lead on the religion game, all while saving the production while researching theology for something like a settler. Furthermore, since you are ahead of the game on theology, you can get Hagia Sophia before everyone else most likely if you wanted to. Later on, you can also get great generals for cheesy citadels or writers for a nice free social policy in a pinch. Great merchants are not even that bad, and it ties well with city-states that want you to research texts since post-theology technologies like archery and mining are researched in just two or three turns. Saving the great musician for the late game is also incredible if you're trying to get influence over other civs. The musician can either win you a culture victory or can undo any dissidents opposing ideologies get. In short, this ability gives the Maya options that the other players wish they could have. There are countless strategies with these great people. Finally, the Maya have a unique building called the Pyramid. It replaces the shrine and gives two faith and also two science. 
This is amazing. It's kind of like a mix of Babylon and Ethiopia. It is less good at doing either of what those two bonuses do in isolation, but the combination, I think, makes it more than worth it. Two science in the early game is basically a 25% increase to science, which is a huge deal. And this also comes before libraries, so you get it before any other player. The Maya can also easily get the earliest religion, and by playing wide, can have one of the strongest religions possible in Civ 5. And, what's even better, is that it's on the way to writing. It synergizes really well with the previous strategy of avoiding all texts except those that lead to theology, as it gives science, and it will be done before the library, and then it gives the National College even more science than it would otherwise. Double Faith also synergizes well with the ability, since the player can use a great engineer on Hagia Sophia to instantly get an enhanced religion, or they can just get a great profit from the BLD itself. The Maya will often have several cities converted far before other civs begin to start spreading their religion, and can help the player with any kind of early strategy they want. Overall, the Maya are incredible and one of the best civs in the game. They get a 5 out of 5 for science, a 5 out of 5 for culture, a 5 out of 5 for diplomacy, and a 4 out of 5 for military. This is because the Maya tend to do better turtling to help them focus on their great people, but getting an early lead will always lead to better military anyways. The Maya get a 20 out of 20 for adaptability, and a 6 out of 10 for impact. While turtling is the best way to play them, there are better turtling civs like Babylon. Finally, the Maya get a 10 out of 10 for miscellaneous, since they can do far more than turtle. This gives them a whopping 55 out of 60, putting them in the S tier. Assyria has some things that can be very game-changing if given the right luck. However, it does not usually happen, and you often need to force it to happen, i.e. deviate from a maybe preferred style of play, but it works sometimes very well. I kind of like Assyria and Continents maps. Assyria's first bonus, and most relevant in my opinion, is the Siege Tower. This unit is basically functionally completely different from its original, the Catapult, but focuses on the same goal. This unit is stronger, has a bonus that will give other siege towers strength versus attacking cities, has extra sight as opposed to the limited sight, so basically two more sight, has cover, does not need to be set up, and becomes a melee unit that can only attack cities. That sentence probably sounded great until the very last part, in which the unit becomes less versatile. In essence, it seems the only way to use it is if the enemy army is dead, but if that's the case, you probably will be taking cities anyways. And that is usually is the case, but not always. An all-out offensive of 2 or 3 siege towers and 3 to 4 composite bows with maybe 1 or 2 spearmen or swordsmen are a non-stop force that will plow through every enemy army. Wars in Civ 5 are often very stally, but because the siege tower has so much strength and gets bonus versus attacking cities with other towers, and it has cover, you can often out-damage the city. Think of it as a less cheap but stronger battering ram. I recommend Assyria on a continent's map because once you build the army, which is easier said than done, there's no reason to stop killing your neighbors. Eventually, happiness is the only thing that will stop you, and once they're dead, continent maps will let you grow in isolation and start focusing on your sieve. The siege tower is an excellent way to completely roll over your enemy, but it's not super easy. High production starts are necessary to get the best out of the siege tower, as well as easy to improve luxuries, so nothing that needs jungle, for example. You also need to make sure your enemies are improving their luxuries, because otherwise your steamroll will be halted by happiness early. I would also like to note that after a few attacks, the Siege Tower can get double cover and will resist cities even more. Next is Assyria's ability, Treasures of Nineveh. If the enemy has discovered a tech that is available to you, you will get that tech when you conquer a city. However, if the enemy has discovered something you do not have access to yet, you do not get both techs and instead only get the prereq. So for example, if you do not have sailing yet and they have optics, you will only get sailing. It's also random what you get in the case they have multiple available to you. This is situationally very good, and that situation is completely luck-based. The way I like to play Assyria warrants going for production techs and siege towers, and then getting calendar and writing through this ability. Avoiding researching writing though is risky, but it can pay off. More often than not though, you'll grab a tech that you were already researching, since the enemy is never that far ahead of you. This also basically never comes into play late game, unless you're completely behind, which means there are other problems to worry about in the first place. This works really well with the Siege Tower, because you can rush it but still get other techs. There are two ways to base what you research off of this, and both are luck based. You either research all low level techs and hope you grab something more expensive from the enemy, but run the risk of not even using the ability if the AI doesn't have anything like philosophy or civil service, 
or you specialize in the lower half of the tech tree so that way you can be guaranteed to have some text like sailing and writing but then you deliberately avoid writing and also may have researched text like ironworking that you could have stolen in the first place. Overall, hit or miss ability. Finally, and the weirdest of a series bonuses is the Royal Library. This replaces the library and gives the units trained in the city bonus plus 10 experience if the Royal Library has its unique great work of writing slot filled. I think the XP is actually not important because it's not enough to get units to level two with a barracks, but I do like the great work of writing slot. This means you can get your writers up early but avoid making amphitheaters so you save hammers early on. With Alhambra, Brandenburg Gate, Autocracy's bonus XP, the three military buildings, and a royal library, you cannot get more than the normal four promotions, which is unfortunate. The 10 XP can give the units a first promotion, so it's nice to save some maintenance on barracks, but you're going to need to eventually build one anyways if you're going to war. Assyria has weird bonuses, but a nice military unit like Arabia. Unlike Arabia, the siege tower is nowhere near as game-changing as the camel archer. Assyria gets a 3 out of 5 for military, 2 out of 5 for culture, 1 out of 5 for diplomacy, and a 1 out of 5 for science. Assyria gets a 5 out of 20 for versatility, since they have an avoid tundra start bias, and the ability is cheeky. Assyria gets a 3 out of 10 for impact, and a 3 out of 10 for miscellaneous. This ends them with a total of 18 out of 60 in D tier. You can go the whole game with none of these bonuses impacting it at all, which is unfortunate. The Siege Tower's ability to take cities seems unique, until you realize melee units could have already done that. Instead, it does damage to cities which extra range units could have done anyways. Combined with its higher hammer cost compared to a Spearman, and it only makes a slight beneficial difference. It's still the best part about Assyria though. The Zulus, unlike Denmark, have exclusive war bonuses that are very nice. In general, having a bonus to war is a mixed bag, since war by definition costs you resources that could potentially not pay for themselves. For example, a library will always give you science, but a spearman may at the end of the day just be a waste of production. So minimizing that risk per production, if you want to look at it like that, is a lot better. The trademark of the Zulus is the MP. The MP replaces the pikeman and has so many bonuses to it, it's absurd. The MP has a spear throw attack, which means when it attacks, it does not initially do an attack, and at first it does a small ranged attack to soften up the enemy before it moves in. The ranged attack usually does about a dozen damage, but it depends on the enemy. I've seen it do as little as 7 and as most as 23. Then, the MP also gets 25% bonus against gunpowder units, which basically means the musketman. This makes the pikeman, which is basically the cheapest viable unit from the medieval to the industrial era, even more viable. When the musketmen roll around, pikemen become very obsolete, but this is not the case with MPs, and so you can save a lot of hammers that way by building much cheaper units that will always be strong. Furthermore, muskets do not get bonuses versus knights like how MPs do, making them even more relevant. What I actually think is the trademark of the Zulus is their barracks replacement, the Ikonda. This building provides unique promotions to melee units, First, the melee unit starts with Buffalo Horns, which is plus 1 movement, plus 25% flank, and plus 10% ranged defense. The next promotion, which you're given the option to select after gaining 15 XP, which the Akonda does for you, is Buffalo Chest, which gives you plus 10% open terrain bonus, plus 25% flank, and plus 10% range defense. The last promotion, which you can get with an armory, is Buffalo Loins, which is plus 10% combat strength, plus 25% flank, and plus 10% range defense. Combining these with the MPs, the Zulus get a unit that has plus 50% versus mounted, 3 movement, 75% flank, 30% range defense, 10% open terrain bonus, and a 10% combat strength bonus. That is absurd. What is important to note is that horse units do not get these bonuses and instead receive the normal promotions from a barracks. This basically gives you a knight at civil service that can also fortify and fight against knights. It is very worth it to build an Akonda right before you research civil service, so you can start pumping out MPs immediately, and they're basically unstoppable at that point. Normally in Civ 5, melee units are very risky to attack with, and MPs being so cheap and having so many promotions make this risk, and thus the risk for more, much smaller. By the end of the Renaissance, you can pump out 2-4 to four turn MPs that decimate knights, lancers, and cannons. 
Finally, the Zulu's ability is Ikloa, which I think is an amazing bonus that is super underrated. Melee units cost 50% less maintenance for starters. Remember when I said war is a trade-off? One of the things that makes war so risky is the fact that you lose a lot of gold from maintenance that could otherwise use to be purchased buildings like universities and public schools. The Zulus really mitigate those damages since MPs will probably compose half, if not more, of your army. At the end of the game, this is less good, but gold is still also less important anyways since most players may have just some kind of surplus then. Additionally, all units require 25% less experience to get upgrades. This means that starting out, the first promotion is not 15 XP, but 75% of 15. Each gap of XP between the levels is 75% of what it normally is. It's not uncommon to get artillery with logistics, crossbows with range and logistics, and planes with air repair, range, and all three bonuses to a domain. At the end of the day, unique units are nice, but a unit with game changing promotions can win you the game over some kind of SIB specific bonus. I find this bonus is actually not too relevant on MPs, but it is nice to get double cover on some MPs and charge on horse units. Really, this bonus shines on the ranged units. Overall, the Zulus, having so many bonuses to war, make war a legitimate, uncostly strategy. They get, much like Denmark, exclusive war bonuses which are so-so. If you have a bad start, you have to wait until the medieval age only for a chance to undo your bad start by taking the enemy's land albeit that chance is rather high thanks to their bonuses. At the end of the day, bad land is bad land, and the Zulus get no science, no production, no growth, and no religious bonuses. They do get gold bonuses, and you may find some strats where having cheap melee units can actually run a profit on GPT by having them tribute city-states. The Zulus get a 5 out of 5 for war, a 3 out of 5 for diplomacy, a 3 out of 5 for culture, and a 3 out of 5 for science. Their ability to stomp a player that is running away, thereby also claiming their wonders, really makes them more viable than they seem on paper. The Zulus get a 8 out of 10 for their impact, because they really are just one of the best war civs in the game, and a 10 out of 20 for versatility. The Zulus avoid jungle, which is, in my mind, means avoid slow starts. Jungle is probably the worst starting location you can get in this game, aside from Tundra. Finally, the Zulus get another 7 out of 10 for miscellaneous, since if you have a neighbor that runs away, the Zulus are really just the ones that get all their wonder bonuses and none of the work. This gives them a 39 out of 60, putting them at the very high end of B tier. If you're on a Pangea map, it's not uncommon to see the Zulus win the game depending on how few players there are before ideologies. Remember 5 seconds ago when I said jungle start is a contender for the worst start in the game? This is because jungle luxuries require bronze working, and then also the tech for the luxury, which is usually calendar, so you have slow expands, and jungle also has no hammers, so you cannot get tiles like plains wheat or sheep. Jungle instead is excellent late game, and is usually where you want your later city seeds so you can develop them more easily with trade routes. Brazil unfortunately has a jungle bias. Brazil's draw is the Brazilwood camp, which takes advantage of this jungle start. Upon researching crossbows, you can build Brazilwood camps fairly quickly in jungle tiles, and they provide two gold and then two cultures with acoustics, which is one or two techs away. Jungle tiles additionally get two science. So for every jungle tile, you're getting two food, two science, two gold, and two culture, which is excellent. Unfortunately, Brazilwood camps do not get modifiers to trading posts, so the science for trading posts in Rationalism does not apply to Brazilwood camps. However, if you can power through a slow start, Brazil's bonus culture means it does not need to worry about dissidents as much from ideologies, and can also get a lot more social policies. I find that Rationalism is filled out very early because of these Brazilwood camps. Brazil's ability is Carnival, which is a rather defining ability. Defining in the sense that this ability tells Brazil exactly how Brazil is going to play Brazil, and there's really no leeway. Carnival gives you plus 100% tourism during Golden Ages, and plus 50% generation of writers, musicians, and artists during Golden Ages. I think this pairs very well with Futurism and the Brazilwood camps, as you can have a huge surge of culture after your ideology, while also having no happiness issues due to your extra social policies and the potential at Prora. The best strategy is to get your writers, artists, and musicians online during a golden age, which occurs right after you took Futurism, for just a huge surge of tourism all over all of their civs. You should be able to go from zero influence to exotic familiar in just a few turns, if done right. 
It is also encouraged to have all of the guilds in one city with as many great people modifiers as possible as to get the absolute most out of that extra 50% generation. Towards the end of the game, Brazil can get easily 600 plus tourism with relatively few great works, mostly thanks to the Brazilwood camps, meaning writers can help you get more social policies. Brazil also has one of the most un-unique unique units in the game, the Prachina. This replaces the infantry and gets you golden age points equal to the combat strength of any unit it kills. Golden ages on epic speed tend to take about 1000 and 2000 points by the time this comes out. The Prachina in the best case scenario will generate 100 for your empire. This is because as you get infantry, the computer does not have enough gold to upgrade their army and mostly has just Gatling guns and lancers for example. So you could hold out. But if you are holding out to use these until the enemies have stronger armies, and thus the potential for maybe more points, you aren't working towards your golden ages, which is what you want in the first place. Overall, this unit's bonus is incredibly situational and hardly impactful when it does arise. I think this should be part of Brazil's ability, not just this one unit in particular, because at the end of the day, it makes it the exact same as an infantry. Brazil gets a 5 out of 5 for tourism, a 2 out of 5 for science, a 2 out of 5 for Diplomacy, and a 1 out of 5 for Military. They get a 5 out of 10 for Impact, as winning Tourism with Brazil is its best way to win, but at the end of the day, a Tourism victory is still largely dependent on how the game plays out, and less about your abilities. If your neighbor declares war on you, for example, you can't be making Tourism, whereas if you're going for Science, you still, by definition of the game, are researching texts, albeit just unconventional ones due to the war. Brazil is probably the most unversatile civ in the game, but I put emphasis on probably because the Brazilwood camp really makes up for any mandatory playstyle of Brazil, and they get a 3 out of 20 for versatility. Without that, they definitely would have gotten a 1 out of 20. Lastly, Brazil gets a nice 2 out of 10 for miscellaneous, since bonus culture can help you approach your tourism victory through various means sometimes. This gives Brazil 20 out of 60, landing them in D tier, but really close to C tier. Brazil is actually better when you do not spawn in the jungle, since the production of not being in a jungle can help you with things like Chichen Itza, then you can just emigrate to jungles. Indonesia is a good sieve that I am very bad at. If you intend to play Indonesia from the get-go by using their bonuses, as I often play games, you'll probably mess up. It's better to ignore Indonesia's ability unless the situation arises, because planning to use it before you start the game can lead to failure. This unique ability is the Spice Islanders ability. For each unique landmass that Indonesia did not spawn on, Indonesia gets two copies of a luxury that would not exist otherwise on a city tile when founded, and the cities can never be raised so that the luxuries never leave the game. Something to note is that each landmass must be unique, so three cities on a landmass you did not spawn on will not give you three unique sets of luxuries. This actually makes it particularly challenging to use this ability, since to get the most out of it you need three good city spots that have not been settled by other civs by the time you discover the location. On a continent's map, you can usually get away with this, but may sometimes get screwed over and have to wait for astronomy to go looking for islands no one lives on. On a Pangea map, you basically cannot use this ability regularly. In essence, this ability is luck based, which is why you should not bank on it. Assuming, however, you did settle these cities and got these luxuries, Indonesia can afford to grow a lot more than you would expect. Indonesia can either do a nice liberty game, since they are less luxury dry than normal, or can have a nice tall game with large cities due to the extra happiness other civs would not normally have. If you trade the extra copy of each luxury for another unique luxury and settle all three cities, Indonesia generates 24 total extra happiness, but after the first initial unhappiness from the new cities, gets a net happiness of 12. That's still nothing to scoff at, since these cities you are settling probably still have uniques of their own anyways. I do recommend larger maps with Indonesia, since that means more potential trading partners. Aside from that, what actually defines Indonesia is the candy, the garden replacement. This garden does not need fresh water, it gives two faith, and then it gives two faith for each religion that had at least one follower in the city. So Indonesia's capital can get four faith from the building in Indonesia's religion, and can then begin trading with other civs to get religious pressure and thus a small amount of followers. If every city in the empire is like this, Indonesia can get insane faith. Indonesia easily gets 20 to 30 extra faith per turn compared to other empires, and as that faith builds up, they can get one to two extra scientists and engineers towards the end of the game. In a pinch, 
this extra faith can make an even game a win for Indonesia, just because they were able to pop scientists to satellites that they would not have been able to do otherwise. Or, for example, when the Industrial Age rolls around, Indonesia can save up enough faith relatively easily to purchase an engineer and easily snag Brandenburg Gate. On top of all this, city placement in theory becomes less crucial since you do not need fresh water for the garden. I personally really like this aspect more than most people. Indonesia has the Chris Swordsman, which replaces the Swordsman. Swordsmen are okay, but not really. Pikemen are usually easier to get to and are stronger. Sometimes, like with Rome, the Swordsman replacement may be worth it. Unfortunately, Indonesian Swordsmen put an emphasis on the May and may be worth it. These swordsmen receive a random promotion when they enter combat for the first time, and out of eight possible promotions, five are good, one is a mixed bag, and two are bad. The fact that a bad unit has a chance at being worse makes it rather unattractive, but if Indonesia's GPT is able to do so, I do believe it's worth it to get units with some of the good promotions and then save them for upgrading into muskets and later on infantry. The promotions are as follows plus 30% when defending and plus 20 HP when healing. Flank is plus 50%. Chris Swordsman get the great general bonus. Two attacks and plus one movement. Up to 50 HP healed if the Chris Swordsman kills a unit. Plus 50% attack bonus and minus 20% defense bonus. Minus 20 HP if turn ends in enemy territory. And lastly, minus 10% when attacking and minus 30% when defending. As you can see, the bad promotions are very, very bad. Consequently, Indonesia can, in a set of very specific circumstances that will probably cost the player more trouble than it's worth, get excellent late game melee units if they just hold on to these units for a long time. Have you noticed what I have said about all of Indonesia's abilities? Indonesia can do X, Y, and Z, but Indonesia has nothing guaranteed. The things it can do often need to be extremely situational for their best outcomes. Because of this, Indonesia gets a 2 out of 5 for culture, a 3 out of 5 for military, a 5 out of 5 for science, since the extra faith and great people generation is fairly consistent, and a 2 out of 5 for diplomacy. Indonesia gets a 2 out of 10 for its best impact. In order for this to be best, many things must go your way, but if it is possible, Indonesia is excellent. Wide Indonesia is so unreliable, it's usually not worth it though. Indonesia's dependency on situations make it less versatile than one might think, so I give it an 8 out of 20 for versatility. However, Indonesia can do things no other Civ can, so I give them a 7 out of 10 for miscellaneous. They end with 29 out of 60, landing them in C tier. Indonesia, in my opinion, is painfully average and, unlike Spain, could not completely sweep the game if things go their way, but instead just has a nice amount of fun if things do instead. Songhai is a sieve that I think is very underrated. They have a lot of bonuses to styles of play players avoid sometimes, but the players avoid those styles of play because they're not viable. Songhai instead opens up a couple of options for different playstyles. First up, Songhai's ability is River Warlord, which has two parts to it. The first part is it gives all units amphibious and war canoe promotions. This defends the units while embarked and removes penalties for attacking from the sea or over a river. The parts relating to embarked units seldom matter, but the ability to avoid river penalties I think is huge. In Civ 5, tile space is limited per military unit, meaning that technically speaking numbers may win, but strategy and positioning is much more viable than more numbers, unlike EU4 for example. Songhai removes one of the bigger handicaps to positioning, which is attacking over a river. It doesn't explicitly say this, but keep in mind that this only applies to melee units who attack, which is not something that they frequently do. However, melee units often don't attack because their positioning is so key. This makes their positioning more versatile, and very few civs do something like that. The other part is that Songhai receives triple gold for pillaging barbarian campments and cities. A settler on epic speed is 680 gold, and usually through minimal spending, by the time you begin settling your second or third city, you may have accumulated three or 400 gold in a normal game. However, if Songhai barb hunts, they can get at least one, but often two settlers in the early game. The first settler only takes two to three encampments, and the other, assuming you have more military, can come even faster. It is also worth it to do barb camp city-state quests, since you get the influence, but also over 100 gold for each camp you pillage. 
In the early game this is huge, and it really doesn't become irrelevant until buildings start to cost about 1000 gold each. Songhai's unique building is the Mud Pyramid Mosque, which replaces the temple. This gives the standard 2 faith, but also costs no maintenance, a temple normally costs 2, and gives 2 culture. Whether or not you score religion, it is very worth it to build these since they let you accumulate faith for scientists as temples normally do, but do not have the high costs that come with temples. This also means that the Grand Temple costs 0 gold per turn as opposed to the 2 times the amount of cities you have per turn. So if you have 4 cities, 8 gold for 16 faith would happen normally, but instead you can get 16 faith for 0 gold. Combined with their ability, Songhai builds up a nice chunk of change and can usually save up faith for scientists, which players who avoid temples do not do, or can save up gold to purchase things like windmills and public schools instantly, or both. Additionally, it gets culture per turn, which is very valuable. It is rather hard to get consistent culture per turn in Brave New World, since most culture is tied to writers and artists, and they're expensive to build. By building this building, you lower your expenses even more. In short, Songhai saves money and saves citizens slash hammers by not having to build a writer's guild for social policies early on. Speaking of minimizing expenses, Songhai has the knight replacement, the Mendekalu Cavalry. This unit has two bonuses. The first is that there's no penalty to attacking cities, and the other bonus is that it costs less production. The production difference is usually about two to four turns less in the capital, and with multiple built can save over a dozen turns easily. If you plan to go to war, you could still afford to put hammers into things like the Grand Temple, which you'll definitely have unlocked. The attacking cities bonus is nice and can suggest that the player can avoid building pikemen altogether, but that is tricky because these knights are still weak to pikemen in the first place. Of course, since they're stronger, attacking them into a city is a bit more viable than a pikeman, and it makes war a bit more of a snowball -y situation, kind of like their ability. Would you have won the war if you could just put a little bit extra damage into the city? Songhai has you covered. That situation is rare, however, and the real appeal is the lower production. The trend I identify with Songhai is that they save expenses and can open up a few smaller areas of play. None, if you haven't noticed, are particularly game-changing, but they are very nice and will likely be relevant at some point in the game. So, Songhai gets a 5 out of 5 for Diplomacy, a 4 out of 5 for War, 3 out of 5 for Science, and a 2 out of 5 for Culture. Songhai is fairly versatile, and so they get a nice 13 out of 20 for versatility. Lastly, Songhai does not really impact the game a bunch, but their key is that they're adaptable to different kinds of play, so they give them a 3 out of 10 for Impact, since they are pretty good religious civ. Songhai ends with a nice 10 out of 10 in Miscellaneous, leaving them with 40 out of 60 in B tier, but so close to A. Also, this did not influence my decision ranking of them, but Songhai has the excellent avoid Tundra start bias. This is a controversial opinion I have in Japan. A lot of people in the Civ 5 community think Japan is a very bad Civ. People consider it one of the worst civs, maybe ahead of a few others. My opinion of Japan though is not so forgiving because I really think they're the worst in the game. Let's go over that. Japan's ability is Bushido, which does two things. First, all units operate at max damage no matter their health, and secondly, fishing boats and atolls provide culture. The culture is meaningless, it's only one per fishing boat, and you basically never have atolls. Not that two culture per atoll would make a difference. The military bonus is such a negligible bonus that it makes only the smallest impact in the game. A unit at 1 health does only 50% normal damage, and since most units you may consider fighting with that are damaged are around the 50 to 99 health range, this bonus is realistically removing a minus 10% or minus 15% combat bonus, but only sometimes. That being said, if a unit is about to die, you should be retreating them, otherwise lose it. In theory, Japan would be able to suicide and slam units into the enemy, but they don't have any kind of bonuses to saving productions on units, so you can't do that. Japan technically has some kind of production saving, however. The Samurai is a Long Swordsman replacement. I have mentioned before that Long Swordsmen are contenders for the worst units in the game, so a replacement for it would have to be really good to make it worth. Well, the Samurai can build fishing boats, which is not completely terrible, but has a tiny, tiny window of opportunity you will never run into. Fishing boats in general are a very costly resource, since a fishing boat can only be used for one resource, so having a way to make continuous fishing boats is nice. The downside is that this comes at steel. 
which you'll never ever prioritize, so you either do not get the best yields out of your tiles for ages, so you can save the production on the fishing boats, or you don't use this bonus at all. It has two military bonuses, Shock 1 and Great Generals 2, which are fine, but don't make the unit usable. Longswordsmen are just bad, and the Samurai does not make it any better, unlike the Berserker. Japan has another military unit, the Zero, which replaces the Fighter. So, in this game, the earlier a bonus comes out, the more, in theory, impactful it is, since that bonus will have influenced something over the span of the whole game. The Zero comes in maybe the last 10% or 20% of the game, when there's probably already a victor, but in the chance there is not, what does the Zero do for you? Well, it's better against other fighters, which is useless, and it doesn't require oil, which is not too useful. Fighters are already very bad at their job since air combat is done better by the bomber and anti-air is done better by the mobile SAM. Instead, the ideal strategy is to spam them to death since they require no oil. In a production-heavy empire, you can have dozens and dozens of zeros, but it doesn't make a difference because they're still a fighter and they're still weak. A dozen zeros does less than six or eight bombers, and you're guaranteed oil with strategic start, so why bother? This unit would be better if it was cheaper and came earlier, meaning you could spam it due to the no oil, but just, it's pretty unusable for where it comes at. All of these bonuses are war bonuses, which are the least consistent bonus in Civ 5, and thus usually not worth it. In some cases, like the Zulus, the war bonuses are made a lot more worth it because the risk versus reward is not as bad of a ratio, and Japan does nothing to change that. They get a 1 out of 5 for war, 1 out of 5 for culture, 1 out of 5 for science, and a 1 out of 5 for diplomacy. They technically have war bonuses, but someone without war bonuses, like the Maya, still do it better than them. I give Japan 2 out of 20 for versatility since they spawn on the coast so they can get a little bit of culture and they can sometimes get good internal trade routes, and I give them a 1 out of 10 for impact. Japan finally gets 1 out of 10 for miscellaneous, give them a whopping 8 out of 60, landing them in the pathetic E tier. Much like Japan, people like to group Polynesia with some of the worst civs in the game. I agree, they're not very good, but my two cents are, if you decide to play Archipelago, this is a very good civ. However, Archipelago is super unbalanced, so we're not doing that. Polynesia's ability is wayfinding, which is kind of weird. I feel like this ability exists for historical accuracy like Carthage's. Basically, units can embark immediately and can cross ocean immediately and a plus one sight when embarked. They also get a plus 10% combat bonus when in two tiles of the Polynesian unique improvement. If for some reason you deduce that settling somewhere not close to you was better, this is great. In the footage I have, I actually found a natural wonder in a hard to reach location, settled it, and got a great religion out of it as a result. Unfortunately, settling not near yourself is hard to do, so it needs to be really worth it, which seldom happens. Reinforcing, getting workers over, and getting city connections for cities that are far away are all very challenging, so you need to be prepared to put a lot of resources into a city that is not near you, especially if it is near someone else and not on some isolated island. The combat bonus is pretty meaningless, and it is a lot worse than the two combat bonuses Ethiopia gets with its ability and unit. This ability also means you can pretty much always found the World Congress first, since there is usually at least one sieve that has not discovered everyone. Founding the World Congress I do not think is too useful to push things you want, but it is important to have early control because that means the computer won't do something stupid like ban a luxury you have. If you happen to get Forbidden Palace, then it gets a nice niche, but it's nowhere near game changing. Polynesia has a very, very situational unique unit, the Maori Warrior. It replaces the regular warrior and gives enemy units adjacent to it a minus 10% combat penalty. This is so meaningless in the early game, so just disregard it then. It does not make any difference with barbarians, does not make the warrior any better when going for early war, as it's going to die in one hit anyways, and cannot help with tributing. As for the late game, the promotion sticks with the units, but as I mentioned with Denmark and Indonesia, it's very hard to take advantage of something like this. If the maintenance for a unit is an average of 2 GPT, then your starting warrior, who may see some use 300 turns in, is going to cost you 600 gold for a minus 10% combat penalty on enemies. It really is not worth it, because you could just buy another unit for a thousand gold and influence the war far more than this ever would have done. Also, you need to pay to promote the unit, so the 600 gold is just for the warrior. If you want an infantry, you're seeing well over a thousand gold spent for this unit for the combat bonus. Polynesia gets kind of a weird bonus, the Moai. 
It's an improvement that must be built on land tiles touching the coast and gives one culture and then plus one culture for each moai adjacent to it. Because of how the coast works, you'll consistently see moais getting two or three culture with the occasional four culture moai. I don't think this makes them particularly worth it, since you're making a trade between two or three culture versus the regular improvements you could have put on those tiles in the first place. Late game, when your cities grow less, it may be worth it, but the two or three culture does not impact your social policy game late game. Early game, you're more than likely missing out on growth and production by working these culture tiles. If you can get a big city up quick before you have room to work specialists, these work great, but it's very situational. These are the epitome of why you should pay Polynesian Archipelago, since you can get tiles that are like six cultures, which then start to become really insane. These also give plus one gold with flight, which is not really that big of a deal. Compare these to Brazilwood camps. Brazilwood camps are going on tiles you will want to work, provide higher consistent culture, which is an instant two culture on acoustics rather than need to build multiple moais, and can get two science with the universities. Polynesia falls under the terminology of situational and just okay. I give them a 2 out of 5 for war, a 2 out of 5 for culture, a 1 out of 5 for diplomacy, and a 1 out of 5 for science. They get a 1 out of 10 for impact, as their best is Babylon's absolute worst, and a 3 out of 10 for miscellaneous, and a 5 out of 20 for versatility. There's not much to say about them, they just really don't impact the game that much. They're unlike Japan, where you'll never make use of their abilities. Wayfinding comes to affect every game, it just doesn't do a lot. They get 15 out of 60 and end in D tier. The Shoshone are a sieve like no other, and I absolutely love playing them. Unlike Polynesia, their non-specific bonuses are really impactful. The Shoshone have a scout replacement, the Pathfinder. This scout is given at the start of the game instead of the warrior, but it is the same strength, and can choose what bonus it receives from a ruin. It also unfortunately does cost more to produce the scout though. Basically, you can choose a bonus, and if in the next two ruins you cannot choose that bonus again. A standard selection to go about is to choose pop ruins, choose a tech once you have pottery discovered for the highest chance of receiving a tech that isn't a lower tier tech, choose upgrades which turn your scouts into composite bowmen instead of archers, and choose culture. Basically, you can just ignore the useless ruins. Also, after some point of time that I've not been able to figure out, you can start to choose faith ruins. With two to three pathfinders, the Shoshone can edit their capital in a very fun way and get four or five pops super quickly if they're smart with the ruins. It is ideal to not choose pop when you have a fair bit of food to the next citizen, since not all the food carries over. It's much better to choose a pop ruin after you just grew. Choosing culture early and getting the tradition slash liberty bonus culture off the bat is also amazing. This is a bigger deal than it seems because basically you can just get settlers out faster if you get a higher pop faster. The Shoshone have a cavalry replacement which is so-so. Basically this cavalry has an upgrade, not something just on the unit, that provides extra movement so the movement sticks while it upgrades the land ships. If you're doing an artillery push, this is fine, but the Shoshone get bonuses to playing on defense, so this seems to be better on reinforcement. Unless your empire is incredibly massive, I don't really see its extra movement coming into too much to play on defense. It's really better on offense, but I don't really feel like it's much of a push change either. It's just a nice little additive, it's not bad, it's just okay. The best part about the Shoshone is their ability, Great Expanse. When they found cities, the cities start with tons of extra territory. I find this absolutely amazing since you seldom rely on your borders expanding to essential tiles. This means forward settling, going wide, and not purchasing tiles, thus spending the gold on something else, almost have no risk. Forward settling with the Shoshone can completely shut down an enemy. You can grab their luxuries and resources they have yet to get, and it's amazing. Besides that, if you're just settling your own lands, you can still work all the best tiles instantly, and can continue to do so as your pop grows. Workers, as a result, do not really need to make many farms or mines, and can instead improve luxuries almost exclusively, which really helps you grow and go wide or the workers can improve all the tiles city by city, and you can get insanely powerful, fast growing cities up super quickly. I absolutely love this ability. It might be one of the best in the game. It has such a high snowball potential. Also, the Shoshone get a bonus when fighting in friendly territory that is the same as the Himeji Castle bonus. The Shoshone are probably the second best snowball sieve in the game, and unlike the mysterious first sieve I have not yet covered, they're less snowbally, but far more consistent on how often they can snowball. 
With the combination of early advantages from the ruins and gigantic territory, the Shoshone are set up for a very impressive start. The downside to all this is that it's dependent on the lands. Having borders increased to grab tiles is fine if the tiles are good, but unlike the Inca, they do not make bad tiles into good tiles. The Shoshone, as a result, are not the best, but are just really good. I give them a 4 out of 5 for culture, 4 out of 5 for science, 4 out of 5 for diplomacy, and a 4 out of 5 for war. I give them a 17 out of 20 for adaptability and a 6 out of 10 for impact. The Shoshone are probably best at turtling, but are versatile enough to do other things like go hyper-religious or play aggressive. Lastly, they get a 9 out of 10 for miscellaneous, since there are really just a lot of other options you can do with them, albeit they do not define any of them, but just make it more accessible to have different approaches to the game. This gives them a total of 48 out of 60 and lands them in A tier. Similar to the Shoshone, I find Siam are a good snowball sieve. Basically, if you can get yourself rolling, you'll continue to roll. If not, however, they do have a few attributes that can help you play the game more standardly. Siam's ability is Father Governs Children. The game's tooltip is actually incorrect about this since the ability does more than what the game says. This ability gives Siam 50% more food, culture, happiness, faith, and experience on units they receive from city-states. The game only says culture, faith, and food. The reason Siam can snowball is because by scoring some early faith or cultural city-states, you can often complete the most faith or the most culture quest city-states have and continue to get more city-states. It's extremely important to open patronage and have a strong religion as Siam, as city-states will decay at a fraction of the speed normally with patronage and the same religion as you. You often become the de facto game leader with all of the city-state bonuses, having the most faith, the most culture, and science if you continue patronage as well as just outplay the AI, since getting the most science should be your priority anyways. Aside from the faith and culture, excess food and happiness allows you to grow seemingly unlimitedly, which then puts you in a spot to do whatever you want over your enemies. The downside is Siam has no bonuses to actually getting the city-states off the get-go, so you often cannot use the ability to its max potential. Consistently, the ability is good, but sometimes it just might be completely game-defining. Siam has a unique building, the Wat, which helps them get the culture quests completed for city-states. This building gives a flat plus three culture to the university, and in the medieval age, plus three over several turns is often enough to win a city-state. Also, something I would like to note is that city-states requesting culture is not the same as how many social policies you get. One city producing 50 culture is nice, it will get you many social policies, but 10 cities producing 10 culture will probably not get you many social policies, but will get you the culture quest completed for city-states. This makes Siam a viable wide sieve, since in theory, they can accumulate enough culture from watts and city-states to undo the downside of too many cities. Alternatively, if you play tall, plus 9 or plus 12 culture per turn is still nice across your empire. It fills a very similar role to the Mud Pyramid Mosque, but unlike that, is on a building you'll prioritize and is far less obscure. Siam has the unique knight, Narjwan's Elephant. This unit does not take horses, has a bonus against horse units, is stronger, and moves one tile less. I think this unit is incredibly strong and is almost as good as the Camel Archer. The bonus versus horses does not mean it is exclusively a knight killer. It can still kill normal units perfectly fine since it's so strong and it does very well against crossbows and city shots. Unlike the Camel Archer, it must take damage when it attacks, so it's less good in that area, but it's still a wall breaker. Knights often fill the role of cheap shots versus unsuspecting units, and this does not do that due to the lower movement. Instead, using it in place of your normal pikeman is fine, and even though it cannot fortify, it still fills the pikeman's job better than it 9 times out of 10. It's a trade-off. Do you lose your knight for a better pikeman? Which would you rather? Arabia has a clearer lose your knight for a game ending menace, but the Narjwan's elephant lives in its shadow. It's honestly a balanced camel archer. I would recommend using these to breach through the defenses of the game's de facto leader, since the AI can likely not stop them under normal means. They're also fine on defense, but fill the role less well than the knight, since knights are better as reinforcement units due to the four movement. Siam basically has the potential to be good. More often than not, I find that they do end up being very good and are rather consistent. How often do you do a game where you just don't get any city-states at all, especially if you're actually trying to do the quests? 
Just like many civs in this game, they need to get a good religion or good land or something in order to get rolling. So in isolation, their other two non-city-state bonuses are just fine and would easily make them a C-tier. I give Siam a 3 out of 5 for culture, 4 out of 5 for diplomacy, 5 out of 5 for science, and 5 out of 5 for war. Keep in mind, just because the AI plays passive as Siam doesn't mean you have to. Siam is an excellent war civ as having city-states is great in war and their knight is very powerful. I give them a 19 out of 20 for versatility and a 4 out of 10 for impact. Lastly, I give them an S5 out of 10 for miscellaneous, giving Siam a total of 45 out of 60 in A tier. I consider Siam to be extremely balanced, maybe slightly leaning on the stronger side. They also have an avoid forest bias, which is good, but means you'll probably get desert or jungle, which is so-so. How often do you spawn in an area that's good without forests? America is kind of like the land England, but they do the job less good. That is unfortunate because land neighbors are always a guarantee and coastal neighbors are not. They're not bad by any means, however. America has the Minutemen, which is a musket replacement and I think it does the job very well. The Renaissance is an interesting era. There's nothing super essential that you need to go for, but there's a lot of nice wonders you could try. It is also where you could decide to go for a frigate or artillery push, or play it standard and get factories and public schools. As a result, the musket is less obscure than the rifle or the long swordsman. Muskets really don't define anything, because while you produce these units, the competitors are building Taj Mahal and Forbidden Palace. These Minutemen, I think, really make muskets a priority for American players, because they have two great bonuses and one that's so-so. The first is they move like scouts, which is huge. Positioning is key in Civ, I've mentioned it before. And while they still have two movement, they basically move like horses. It's a stronger knight that doesn't take horses, isn't weak to lancers, and can fortify. How often do you see terrain that is just completely flat? Furthermore, they also start with rough terrain promotions, which further encourages their use in heavy terrain. This will make the usually stally wars of the Renaissance and Medieval much faster, and it's not wrong to suggest these Minutemen are great reinforcers and great frontliners. Of course, you still need some firepower behind them, this is why I think it is best to avoid rushing Alhambra as America if you decide to go for war. Instead, play it safe and get your universities and workshops out. Then, beeline for artillery and get Brandenburg Gate. In the city with Brandenburg, you can get Minutemen that start with Blitz or March and can build a bunch of them. When I discussed Indonesia and Polynesia, I talked about if it's worth it to keep all these units around to upgrade them. I definitely think so with Minutemen. Going from a musket to a rifle, to a Great War to an infantry is less than 500 in upgrades for each unit, and with Brandenburg will give you infantry that are impossible to kill. Or you can just skip the upgrades and go with the artillery rushed Minutemen. In theory, having an indestructible and incredibly quick unit will save you hammers, since you hopefully won't be making more, so these guys in a specific set of circumstances make war very cheap. America does something similar with the B-17. Basically, it's a bomber that starts with Siege 1. So, in all American cities, you can now produce aircraft that start with air repair immediately, which is what makes aircraft viable in the first place. They work fine if you're ahead, but if you aren't, you probably want land unit promotions instead to kill the enemy's army. Thus, it's a nice addition, but a bit of a case of win more. Alternatively, you could skip air repair and try to beeline for logistics and get one more promotion from combat, which I think is less viable and probably dishes out less DPS than if you were just healing and attacking once per turn anyways. America's ability is Manifest Destiny, which gives land military units plus one site and makes purchasing tiles 50% cheaper. The tile purchasing makes America a very viable wide sieve, which would make the B-17 even better since that unit is better determined on how many you can produce in different cities at once. Forward settling and buying land is not unheard of with America, and buying 3 or 4 tiles turns from 600 gold to 300. If that's the case, and a player was going to spend 600 anyways, why not just settle another city and buy more tiles? The options are not so limited. The site also helps with a few things, getting ruins, spotting cities over hills, and helping artillery fire into cities. A scout can still get the plus one site, which means you could have 4 or 5 site scouts, which is insane. But at the end of the day, is there really even any benefit to that? If it was that big of a deal, you could have just gone and scouted the land anyways. The tile purchasing is really good though. 
America is best a war sieve. Their only non-war bonus is buying tiles, which is nice, but is best used in forward settles, which will lead you to war anyways. I give them 5 out of 5 for war, 1 out of 5 for diplomacy, 1 out of 5 for culture, and 2 out of 5 for science. This is because they have the unique river start bias, which in theory would promote a lot of growth and access to the ocean. America has an 8 out of 20 for adaptability, since they do have some ways to recover if they fall behind, and a 4 out of 10 for impact. Lastly, I give them a 7 out of 10 for miscellaneous. This is a total of 28 out of 60, landing them in C tier. They're okay, probably better depending on the player, but really the only thing makes them is the Minutemen. Unlike America, Persia is a good war sieve that has versatility to its name. I think Persia's exact benefits to war and isolation are less good than the Minutemen, but they come pretty close and are way more consistent. So, Persia's ability is Achaemenid Legacy, if I'm saying that right. Golden Ages are 50% longer, and during Golden Ages, units gain plus 1 movement and a plus 10% combat bonus. As we discussed with Polynesia, a 10% combat bonus does not do much, but Persia's is way better because they don't have to sacrifice anything to get it, and it applies to more than just the warrior. So instead of a chore, it's a nice little extra. The longer Golden Ages may make it seem like you want to do your warring during them, but that's not exclusively the case. Keep in mind, Golden Ages are extra money in culture, so Persia can get consistent high culture and GPT from those longer Golden Ages. Lastly, the plus one movement is a bit hard to take advantage of, but you can use it consistently and effectively to make the best out of it. If not, no big deal, then it just becomes a nice little passive bonus like the plus 10% combat bonus. Basically, with Chichen Itza, or Freedom, or both, you can get artists that generate 20 turn Golden Ages. Aesthetics has two Golden Ages in it, and the ability to purchase Argus, which would then be Golden Ages on command. Liberty also has a Golden Age. If you're able to get Chichen Itza or Freedom or both, you could stockpile artists and get Golden Ages from turn X until the end of the game. It's a very specific set of circumstances, but it makes Persia so worth it. Like I said, if it isn't pulled off, no big deal. I would also like to note, it's not at all needed to get both Chichen and Freedom, as one of the two is plenty of turns to a Golden Age. And, okay, that's fine and all, but that means I can't get reliable Golden Ages until I'm finishing Aesthetics, or I've generated tons of artists, right? Well, no, because the Satrap's Court is a bank that gives two happiness. Banks are great buildings, and they make your GPT even higher during a Golden Age, and if you get screwed over by your lands, these direct happiness buildings can make it less painful. So, either it saves you, or it puts you ahead. The bank replacement never does nothing. You'll always have banks, and you'll always make use out of the happiness. The only downside is they don't come out to the Renaissance, so they won't be really, like, helping where you settle cities, but they can help you manage your expansions through war. For example, if your neighbor is ahead, but has the same luxuries as you, it might be very expensive to kill him. The bank will make the penalty your empire sees less terrible. Lastly, Persia has the Immortal, a spearman that's a bit stronger and heals at double rate. I don't think these are good as everyone makes them out to be, but maybe I'm just bad at the game. I find that Persia should be rushing Chichen Itza, and these get replaced rather quickly as a result. In the meanwhile, if you have one or two, they're great for either bullying city-states or barb hunting. If city-state A wants you to bully city-state B, and it wants a barb camp gone, these guys do it great. Consequently, while the computer rarely invades early, they do scare off stray Attilas and Shakas fairly well. On offense, they make little difference, but early war is already very unviable, so it's fine. I'm a big fan of barb hunting more than most people, and I like this unit for that. Happiness is hard to come across in this game, so by having easy to access consistent happiness, Persia is already great. I give them 4 out of 5 for war, 4 out of 5 for diplomacy, 2 out of 5 for culture, and a 5 out of 5 for science. Persia, in order to be incredible, needs to do one of two things, and often has players always going aesthetics anyways, so they're less versatile than they may seem. That being said, if you don't do Chichen Itza, Freedom, or Aesthetics, they're not bad by any means, it just makes it harder to use their longer Golden Ages. As a result, I give them a 14 out of 20 for Adaptability, and an 8 out of 10 for Impact, and a 10 out of 10 for Miscellaneous. When Persia is good, they're really good. Game-changing good. They get a 47 out of 60 in A tier. India and Persia are not too different. They both have an early game war unit, they both have a tier 2 building replacement, 
tier 2, meaning you have to build a prereq first, and they both have benefits to happiness. Where Persia still manages to fit in a building there that gives them longer golden ages, India is instead the Regigigas of Civ 5, or the slow start Civ. So, population growth, India's ability is weird. City unhappiness is doubled, and population unhappiness is halved. Normally, founding a city is three unhappiness from the city, but India begins the game with less happiness than normal because of this. It is worth it to go for an early worker over a granary or library, or maybe even a shrine to get the luxuries up, because if you don't get happy, then you can't expand, and India's ability doesn't make it subjective for whether or not you should expand. In fact, it's worth it to expand as much as possible as India, because at 7 population, your city will produce as much unhappiness as it normally would, and then from 8 onwards, you finally make a net gain of happiness. The issue is getting luxuries and getting workers up early. This also means that you probably won't be growing your capital as best as you could, since improving a luxury helps you grow very little, as opposed to improving wheat or something. But anyways, let's say that you got out of the stressful but manageable early game. India then becomes a monster sieve that doesn't really have to do one type of thing. With unlimited happiness comes unlimited population, and with unlimited pop comes science. It's almost like India is Babylon with extra steps, where they're very much at the mercy of their lands. However, having this extra happiness means wonders like Notre Dame or Taj Mahal are not super essential, and you can prioritize universities with little issue. Alternatively, you can kill your enemies, since if their cities do not drop below 7 pop, integrating them to your empire isn't too challenging. Hypothetically, let's say your lands suck, and you can't expand. There aren't enough luxuries, you got forward settle, whatever. What now? Well, the Chariot Archer replacement, the War Elephant, is here to save the day. It's a stronger Chariot Archer with less movement, however, unlike the Chariot Archer, it's not stopped by rough terrain, so really, on average, it moves more quickly. Chariot Archers are a very good, cheap, and powerful military unit, and the War Elephant is all that and more. Killing your opponent's capital early means you have your lands and his or her lands to expand into, and since India can in theory grow as much as they want, this opens up a lot of opportunities. They're also stellar on defense, far better than the Chariot. Overall, a really consistent and amazing unit. Lastly, India has a castle replacement, the Mughal Fort. This castle is far more obscure than the bank or the university, so off the bat, India's building seems less good than Siam's and Persia's. So a castle would need to be really good to make it worth it. That's not the case. It provides a measly 2 culture and then 2 tourism way later in the game, and those just aren't big enough reasons to build it. Realistically, you'll get a castle from Alhambra or something, and then maybe build some more castles if you really have nothing to do while researching plastics. That's the only time you make castles, and 2 culture just really doesn't do anything for them anyways. On defense, a castle is nice and all, but a single military unit will do more for you than a castle will, so really it's just an issue with castles being underpowered, and India's 2 culture doesn't make them any better. It's not unrealistic to go the whole game without seeing these built. India's appeal is the unlimited population, but that's at the mercy of their start. Can you get luxuries? Can you get workers? Can you expand fast enough? Can you grow fast enough? If all of those are a yes, congratulations, you have well over 40 population cities. I give them 5 out of 5 for war, 3 out of 5 for culture, 5 out of 5 for science, and a 4 out of 5 for diplomacy. India is fairly versatile in the late game, but is really at the mercy of their start. I give them 8 out of 20 for adaptability, a 7 out of 10 for impact, and a 7 out of 10 for miscellaneous. India earns 39 out of 60, barely missing the A tier. The Celts, I think, are one of the better sibs at being wide, probably slightly less good than the Maya. That being said, being wide is niche because it's consistently less good than being tall. The Celts both have bonuses to mitigating the losses played by being wide, and bonuses that are more relevant the wider you play. In isolation, a wide sieve and a tall sieve that are both good will always have the wide sieve in the game be better, because it's not that playing wide is bad, it's just that it's more situational. When a sieve is successfully wide, it is at worst as good as the tall sieve, and consistently better, so if you can go wide, why not do it? The Celts have a unique unit, the Pictish Warrior. This is a Spearman replacement that loses the bonus versus mounted units and gains faith on kill. It also has a 20% bonus when outside of friendly territory, making it around 13-ish, 14-ish combat strength, and it does not need to use movement to pillage. This unit is an excellent barb hunter, probably the best in the game for this point. There is little downside, so really it's just about the opportunity cost of using it. 
Against opponents, ranged units will be better at actually doing the killing since your melee units need to be alive to take hits, so it's not as good in wars as it seems, but it's still marginally better than the spearmen. Against barbarians, you could build these before researching pottery and make up for the lost faith you would have gotten from a shrine. Both of these scenarios require that you at least make some kind of sacrifice to make the most out of the unit, either go to war early on, or build it earlier since the longer around it's the better. And that's unfortunate. Let's say then that this is just built just as often as a normal spearman. It's fine then, but nothing game changing. You cannot get any more tribute since it's still 11 combat strength, and with barb killing at that stage you may see 20 or 30 faith per warrior generated over the game. It's in the eye of the beholder to determine how good it is, but with the ability for the Celts, I think it's great since more often than not you can skip a faith pantheon like stone circles. Game changing? No. Consistent? Not really. Still overall better than Spearman? Marginally. The Celts have their ability Druidic Lore. If there is one unimproved forest next to a city, you get one faith per turn, and with three or more forests you get two faith a turn. Basically, the Celts get first pantheon always, and they usually get first religion. What is not apparent is how important removing forests next to your city is, and this bonus usually goes away sooner rather than later. It is worth it to remove the forest in most scenarios, since getting hammers for a wonder is probably more important than faith. That being said, the non-faith pantheons in this game are very powerful, but are unviable because faith pantheons are just so much more important. Getting a non-faith pantheon is possible as the Celts, meaning sun god or culture from jungle tiles is possible. At the end of the day, you cannot ignore your shrine for too long, since if you want to make a use out of these pantheons, you still need to compete for a religion. As a religious civ in general, the Celts aren't too different from a civ with no bonuses to religion, since their faith goes away rather quickly. However, going wide accumulates a lot of faith, and since religious pressure and faith is linear, meaning requirements don't scale with the number of cities, the more cities you have, the better. The Celts take that to the extreme and become an extremely powerful religious civ, Religion is pretty important in Civ, you can get tons of gold or happiness for doing what you wanted to do anyways. Then, at the end of the day, you can purchase great scientists to be able to get the later text faster than the computer. So in a way, the Celts have the potential to be a great science Civ in that regard, but it's situational. Situationally game-changing, as you will. The Celts also have an Opera House replacement, the Keitel Hall. Opera houses often go unbuilt in most games, so a replacement for them is unfortunate, but at the same time it makes them more appealing. Hermitage, I think, is incredibly underrated, so a sieve that prioritizes opera houses is nice in that regard. This opera house gives 3 happiness, which is an absurd amount. This would be OP if it weren't for the fact that it was on the opera house, which requires it and the amphitheater to be built. It makes the Celts good at being tall and wide, since the happiness helps wide play especially, and being tall means you get the free culture building and thus save hammers towards the opera house. In the scenario you are happy, this gives you the ability to ignore the public opinion and go with what ideology suits you best. Happiness as a whole is just very versatile, and this building is great for that. Being behind the amphitheater is a bigger deal breaker than it seems, however, and since public opinion happens in a pinch, you really need to spend some point in your game getting these up. It is unfortunate, since if things are going well, you should always be prioritizing taking away opportunities from your opponent like Wonders or Lan, and building local culture infrastructure is just not all that viable. Winning over the computer with happiness via public opinion also is not viable since the AI cheats on happiness anyways. At the end of the day though, if you find a culture victory is best, you're going to have two kinds of great work slots building already made and a public opinion you can probably disregard. So religion and happiness, nothing that actually is directly affecting the four victory types. Does that make the Celts bad in that regard, or better since they seem customizable? It's hard to say. I give them a 2 out of 5 for science, to me they're simply just normal at science, but they can stockpile faith for the end of the game. In a 4 city game, 12 happiness from opera houses is nice, but there's always a way to combat 12 happiness in different ways, such as the plus 2 happiness from monuments in order, which in a way is way better since it doesn't have that huge production barrier behind it. I give them a 4 out of 5 for war, since religion can be key in war and happiness is key, and I give them a 3 out of 5 for culture, and a 4 out of 5 for diplomacy. The Celts get a 15 out of 20 for adaptability, a 3 out of 10 for miscellaneous, because sometimes their ability just can't get used, sometimes you shouldn't settle next to a forest, and a 7 out of 10 for impact. In a wide game, the Opera House replacement can give you realistically 21 happiness, which is insane. Tied with Pagodas, and the biggest downside of wide is gone. I would also like to note that the Celts are not the best wide sieve. 
I think there are two civs that are better than them that I've just yet to mention. The Celts are probably just as good as the Maya at being wide, and the Maya are still better at being tall than they are at being wide anyways. This gives the Celts 38 out of 60 in B tier. They're actually my second favorite civ behind the Maya. Austria is very, very fun and has benefits in a sieve that I think are incredibly undervalued in this game. It has a case of what I call the great man theory of Civ 5, and that once you're ahead, it kind of gives you more opportunities to get ahead. Alternatively, you just need some good land and then you can take advantage of their stuff. Austria's best part about them is the coffee house, a windmill replacement. Windmills are very important, basically any production building is, and this exchanges the plus 10% building production of the windmill for plus 5% overall production, meaning it affects units and wonders, which is marginally better. Also, they can be built on hills, which removes one of the bigger downsides to settling on hills. Finally, they provide plus 25% generation to great people in the city, which is just amazing. Considering that this comes shortly after universities but before public schools, you'll definitely notice the generation. With this, National Epic, a garden, rationalism, freedom or order, and leaning tower, Austria gets 125% generation in best scenario, but usually they'll only get 100% generation to great scientists. With aesthetics, they also get this towards writer, artists, and musicians. It's important that this building can be built on hills, as Austria has a hill start bias. Plus 5% production towards everything in cities with already ludicrous production from the hills? Yes, please. Austria has the diplomatic marriage ability, which is what I find the most game-changing and hardest to use of their abilities. If you can use this ability consistently, you are probably going to win, but if not, it's still good, just not too impactful. It has a challenging window of opportunity to use one behind. Basically, when you're an ally of a city-state for 5 turns, you can pay around 700 or 800 gold on epic speed to annex the city-states. This comes with a few opportunity costs. Basically, to get a free city, you lose the following about 800 gold, an ally that was supplying some kind of bonus, and if the ally was mercantile, you don't get the unique jewelry or whatever that they have, and the potential unhappiness associated with the city from annexing it. Also, the city needs to be in a good location, which city-states often are not. They tend to have one luxury and are usually in bad-to-defend locations, and city-states usually never have faith-building made since they don't generate faith. That's a lot of downsides, but it's literally a free city and the military that comes with it. You can start proxy wars with these, or you can conquer city-states you wanted to without warmonger penalties, meaning you can still get support for your votes in the Congress, and you can still trade luxuries. Alternatively, you can expand if your land is too compact, so really, it's just a nice ability that gives you options. I think it's a lot harder to use than the coffee house because a lot needs to go right for it to use it, but if everything does go right, it's stellar. Lastly, there's the cavalry replacement, the Hussar. Unlike the winged Hussar, this is not amazing, but it's still pretty better than an already good military unit. This is far better than the Shoshone Unique in my opinion. Flanking bonuses get increased by 50%, so 10% goes to 15%. They have extra sight and extra movement. That's pretty much everything you want in cavalry, so it's nice that these are here. Again, however, they fill the role better than something that already filled it well, so it doesn't do anything for you that a unit like the Minuteman does. I find it is better on defense than cavalry by a margin, so if you have an aggressive neighbor, it's not a bad strategy to go for Brandenburg. That way you can deny them that wonder, and you can get your Hussars up ready. They also penetrate enemies with the Great Wall better, but besides those two situations, the Hussar and the cavalry are pretty indistinguishable despite the bonuses. Really the best part is the flank. Austria's ability to buy city-states and generate absurd amount of great people is one of the most unique things in Civ so there's a lot of open-up playstyles that may have not been apparent that are possible compared to other civs. Austria gets a 1 out of 5 for diplomacy, since they actually have no benefit to getting city-states as allies, a 4 out of 5 for culture, 4 out of 5 for war, and a 3 out of 5 for science. Austria has a 16 out of 20 for versatility, and a 7 out of 10 for impact, where they go tall with lots of great people, possibly with freedom through New Deal. Alternatively, you could generate no one and wait for futurism, but then you lose the plus 25% generation from freedom or order, so pick your poison. Austria finally gets a 6 out of 10 for miscellaneous via their city-states. This gives Austria a total of 41 out of 60 in A tier. It may be controversial to rank Austria higher than India. Most people would agree that the war elephant makes a much bigger impact than the Hussar, and that population growth is more consistent, 
but the coffee house is just too good to pass up compared to the useless building that is the Mughal fort. Many people consider France the worst Civ in the game, but that's probably not the case. They're certainly bad, but I think they can at least get some kind of impact. The issue with France is that they get advantages to tourism victories, but those advantages can only come in place if you were already going to win anyways. Occasionally they may be coming clutch. So let's get the non-tourism bonus out of the way. France has the Musketeer, which replaces the Musketmen. All it does is that it's stronger, it's 28 combat instead of 24. I do not think this is as significant as it seems, as rifles, which can combat muskets fairly easily, are 34 strength. In this game, combat strength is determined by how higher of a ratio your combat is than the enemies. So if you're 2 and they're 1, you'll do massive damage, but if you're 100 combat and the enemy is 99, there's hardly any difference. The Musketeer has in essence a 16% combat bonus versus other muskets in this regard, or it just has the Great General bonus. You also probably know that Great Generals are best when they impact all the units, particularly the Archer units, and for their Clutch Citadel bonus. Instead, this is a bonus that is only on your melee unit, which is not bad, but melee units are less good on offense, so think of it as an exclusive defense bonus. Now, compare this to the Minimit, who starts off with Drill, which is a plus 15% combat bonus in Rough Terrain. That means in Rough Terrain, the Minutemen is identical to the Musketeer, but also comes with other bonuses as well. Also considering since melee units are good at taking hits and defending, you want them in Rough Terrain anyways. The difference becomes clear, and the Musketeer has a nice bonus, but it does not make as big as an impact as it may seem. Pure power is never bad, but some units like the Siamese Knight get the additive of being on a great attacking unit, not a unit that is already not that good in the first place. That being said, rushing for muskets is not a terrible idea as France, since longswordmen just suck so much. If you can get musketeers before they get longswords, it is a very very big deal, but the downside is you get a bunch of worthless texts instead of universities or astronomy. France's tourism ability, City of Light, gives any kind of tourism building or wonder in the capital that has a theming bonus double tourism to its theme bonus. So, Oxford University requires two great works of writing from different eras and different civs that are not the city owner. If you pulled this off, rather than plus two for the theme, it's plus four. Theming bonuses are not too hard to get on many buildings. Some are harder than other, like all of the art wonder bonuses, so realistically this can't apply to everything. But there is only one building in the game that applies a theming bonus, the museum. That means to use this, you have to have lots of wonders in your capital. But if you have those, you're probably already doing well anyways since they have bonuses of their own, such as the free tech that comes with the Great Library. So really, this does nothing but make you get public opinion in a tourism victory slightly faster since you're already doing well anyways. There's also the opportunity cost of going for every theming wonder ever. It may be nice to get the Louvre, but that means you're not researching public schools and factories. It may be nice to build Great Library, but you're not getting settlers and workers out. Obviously every wonder comes with an opportunity cost, but France needs to get lots of them for it to take effect, which means you either don't use the bonus or don't build wonders slash infrastructure. What's more valuable, Globe Theater or Leaning Tower of Pisa? Well, even as France, probably the Leaning Tower. That being said, the early tourism may be from the Great Library, Oxford, or Globe Theater can be nice for enforcing people to conform to your ideology, but as I've already discussed, the computer cheats on happiness, so they'll probably not choose your ideology anyways. It has its moments, but few, and since you can never tell in essence if you can go for it ahead of time, may in some situations be less beneficial than if you just built something else. An ability where you need to predict in order to use it well is not a very good one. Finally, France has the Chateau. You can build this fort replacement next to a luxury resource, but not next to another Chateau. It gives plus one gold and plus two culture, and those are changed to plus three each once flight is researched. So before flight and after flight is how we should view this. Before flight, you want to be growing your cities with food tiles, so since these do not provide food, that's a bit unfortunate. But if you're going to work something like a two food, three gold plantation anyways, then this is better as a two food, one gold, two culture. Unfortunately, if things are going well with your lands, you won't be working these tiles, I would say only work these if you get insane growth, but again, like City of Light, if you're doing well, then this is just icing on the cake. 
If you're not doing well, it's honestly worse to work this rather than a four food tile. In this scenario, you are working all of your best food tiles though, and are still behind. This can help you get some social policies if you get maybe five or six across your empire, but that scenario is rare. So, if you want to rush for flight, I think the plus three golden culture is not bad, and flight is not too obscure of a tech to rush. The downside is that if you want to make the chateau to have an impact, you need to rush flight, because getting it normally just makes it come so late in the game it won't have an impact, which again, is another opportunity cost like City of Light. However, with an airport and a hotel, a few chateaus build up to a nice chunk of tourism, and you can risk to see maybe plus 12 tourism per city. 36 to 48 tourism is not bad, but becomes obsolete quick. It would be better if this came into effect before ideologies, but by the time you get this, people will be getting near 100 culture per turn anyways. I think the chateau has a higher opportunity cost than City of Light, and it has less reward. France's shtick is taking a high risk for little reward. It is wrong to assume you pulled the risk off, and something like the Musketeer and the Chateau are much more riskier than City of Light, so honestly, you could just assume you didn't even pull it off. France gets a 1 out of 5 for war, 2 out of 5 for culture, 1 out of 5 for diplomacy, and 1 out of 5 for science. In fact, if I could take away fewer points for science, I would, because France has bonuses against science in a way, since you want to work artist slots and not science slots. You want to go for military techs and not universities, and you want to work culture tiles and not growth. France gets a 1 out of 20 for adaptability, a 2 out of 10 for impact, and a 3 out of 10 for miscellaneous, since chateaus are all luxuries, even sea ones, as long as they border land tiles. You could argue they make desert hills better with Petra, but it's so situational it doesn't matter. This gives them 11 out of 60 in D tier. Just terrible, what an insult to a country that has done so much history, and you choose a mechanic and don't even do it well. This sieve is similar-ish to France, where things need to go your way to get the best out of them. However, they still give you options other sieves do not have on a consistent level, unlike France. In the best case scenario, you're ahead and you get an even stronger lead. In worst case, you can do things you would do otherwise with more ease. Not that doing things you already do is better, but instead giving you the ability to do other things with less opportunity cost. First, the main part of Byzantium is the ability Patriarch of Constantinople, which gives you a bonus belief when you found a religion. This can be a second founder belief, a second pantheon, a second early follower belief, so in total you get three once you enhance, or an extra enhancer belief. In general, pantheons are bonuses to something you want on tiles, like extra faith, extra food, extra culture, etc. Founder beliefs are something exclusive to you that you get the more your religion is spread. Follower beliefs are bonuses specific to the city, and enhancer beliefs are bonuses to spreading the religion. As Byzantium, I like to go with early enhancer beliefs to get an edge above my opponents, or follower beliefs to make my city powerhouses. As Byzantium, you can get pagodas, plus 15% production, and plus 2 happiness from gardens or temples. So for every city you have, you can get 4 happiness, 2 faith, and 2 culture. Or you can get Messiah early, which generates profits at 25% less cost, so you can enhance much earlier and get holy sites out earlier. The options are endless for what is the best combination, but Byzantium definitely has the best potential religious game out of all civs. However, the downside is, A, you have to somehow get a religion, and B, you still have to compete with other religions. If you've ever played Civ against the computer, you'll probably know that the AI goes absolutely insane with their faith and will do nothing to stop from having their religion overwhelm the world. Even with less faith generation, they still somehow spread it better than you. So bonuses to religions instead of direct faith are less than ideal in that regard. It isn't hard to outdo the AI, just sometimes, in fact most of the time, it's just not worth it. If you do not have great faith generation, it might be worth it to go for something that will get you more faith, which then just makes your faith similar to Ethiopia or something, but far later in the game. Faith is not bad though, it is free engineers and scientists, and if you go to piety, which is rather incentivized on religious civs, you can choose to the glory of God, which gives you the ability to choose whatever great person you want with faith. Byzantium also has two unique units, the first of which is something I find hard to make use out of, but is marginally better than its replacement, and the second which is something that is a complete unique spin on another unit. Consequently, these units do fantastic when they're used together. The Cataphract is a horseman replacement that has less movement, but comes with an array of bonuses. They are stronger, they receive defensive terrain bonuses, they don't do as bad against cities, but they still do a little bad, and they can fortify. 
So first off, don't think attacking these into cities is a good idea just because they have minus 25% combat instead of minus 33%. They're still bad at that. Everything else is game changing about the unit though. Think about the ratio between this and the musketeer. Instead of being 16% stronger, this unit's 25% stronger, which is a big, big deal. Since they also receive defensive terrain bonuses, they can take hits incredibly well for the era they come in, and also can take hits even more since they fortify. They truly are the best at soaking up hits and dealing finishing blows. If the unit is on a rough terrain tile, there is not as in danger as a horseman might be, and remember this is a horseman, so it can move and attack. So they can absorb all the damage and deal the finishing blows the best, which is what melee slash horse units tend to do. What dishes out the damage? Well, that would be the Droman, obviously. This is a trireme replacement, and it receives a ranged attack instead of a melee attack. The strategy is to power through their army with cataphracts and kill the cities with the Droman. Dromans also easily decimate enemy triremes as they come with bonuses against naval units. These two synergize really well, and are best at killing a potential runaway or religious enemy early. If you neighbor Poland and he has Salton Mountains, it's probably best to kill him. If you neighbor Boudica and she has Stonehenge, it's probably best to kill her. Let's say you're doing fine though, and you got a religion and you don't have immediate competition. It's probably just best to skip them, because by the time you get your settlers out, religious infrastructure out, national college out, and maybe a wonder or two, there's really little time to use these before they come obsolete. Use these two as an emergency button. If you instead run into the game with the intent to use these, which you should never do with anything FYI, but if you do, then they're great at early war, but they still come with the downside of doing early war, which is almost exclusively detrimental. Byzantium has a strategy to do, and also a way to come back if you tried that but couldn't. I dislike civs that are blatantly, do this or you get no bonus, but Byzantium's bonus is usually pretty good so it's fine. I give them a 4 out of 5 for war, religion, or at least tithe and happiness, is key in war. A 2 out of 5 in science, as theology is on the way to education, and religion helps with science as it's very versatile. A sieve with an incentive to go piety can do that if they feel they cannot finish rationalism to get the free scientists. Byzantium gets a 2 out of 5 for diplomacy and a 2 out of 5 for culture. They really have no direct bonus to those other than tithe and the ability to afford to build culture infrastructure if their religion is strong enough. Also, city-states have their influence to grade slower if you have a shared religion, so it may be worth it instead to go patronage if you have many city-state neighbors. I give them a 10 out of 20 for adaptability, since the bonus is versatile but does not come out until you actually found the religion, and a 2 out of 10 for impact, but it's still really good, so a 9 out of 10 for miscellaneous. They are good, but just given the criteria for how I judge versatility and the impact, I need to give their points somewhere else. This gives Theodora a lovely 31 out of 60 in B tier. Not the best religious civ on the regular, but emphasizes what religion does for the player more than anyone else. Religion's a lot more than faith equals good. Remember when I just said early war is detrimental? Well, throw away that idea completely, because here come the Huns. The Huns have the battering ram, a spearman replacement. This becomes a siege unit that can only attack cities, but gets insanely powerful bonuses at super low cost. Catapults are often not considered worth it because their high investment combined with their lackluster damage and defense just is not worth it. Battering rams perform better than catapults and best of all do not need to be set up. Furthermore, it's a spearman, so the hunts can replace the warrior with this on a ruin. A battering ram can kill a flatland city with no military units nearby by itself in the early game, but that usually doesn't happen. But can still perform just fine with an extra scout or warrior and taking out a city in the early game. Alternatively, battering rams can take cities with little to no issue. Early game war's hardest obstacle usually are the cities as a matter of fact, since siege units suck and archers are so frail. This leaves chariots, which are cheap but frail, or comp bows, which are a lot of investment for not much damage, to deal damage to cities. However, this unit can be built for very little hammer investment and can annihilate enemy cities. All you need to do is a unit that kills their army. That is where the horse archer comes in. This is a chariot replacement, which just fixes everything wrong with the chariot. The chariot was already fairly good, I think a bit overrated, but still good. This unit does not stop with rough terrain like the chariot, starts with an accuracy promotion, and that's actually one of three in the game, they get a flatland bonus, does not require horses, and is a bit tankier. So normally chariots have two big downsides, which were their frail defenses and the limited amount you can make them because of the horses, but this throws both of those out the window. Then, on top of all that, 
They're so faster than the chariot, which makes them incredibly versatile. These things can destroy enemy armies and cities with ease, and since they start with a promotion, it takes not as long as it might seem to get logistics or range. I would highly suggest logistics since, as a horse unit, it can move and shoot, which is invaluable in this game. They have amazing synergy with the battering ram, but honestly, they're the better of the two units. Early war is detrimental because of how many resources you need to put in to just get only a little reward, but these units overwhelm the enemy with their sheer power, you can take far more land than normal with the same amount of military. Alternatively, a single horse archer and batting ram is plenty to solo poorly defended enemy cities, and most if not all flatland cities cannot stop themselves from the Huns. So that all sounds good, and is really what you should be doing as the Huns, but it isn't even the Huns' best part. The Huns' ability, Scourge of God, is absolutely fantastic. Firstly, this is the only aesthetic ability in the game, i.e. an ability that has a part which does not affect the gameplay. The Huns in real life did not have cities or anything that they settled, so in Civ 5, when the Huns settle a city, it's actually just a city name that would have belonged to another Civ. If the Huns and America in a game, the Huns have a chance to settle Boston, and that offers no competitive difference. What this ability actually does that affects the gameplay is that cities raise at double speed, which is far better than it seems to avoid rebels. You start with animal husbandry, and pastures provide plus one production. The ability to start with animal husbandry is absolutely game-changing, and you can immediately start finding ideal city spots due to the horses. Furthermore, the production across the game is quite a bit, since it's from turn one. You can realistically see over 1,000 hammers from this ability across your empire. In the late game, an extra hammer probably doesn't matter too much, but in the early game, an extra hammer gets sellers and wonders out that much quicker. This is what makes early war even cheaper for the Huns, but because production is so versatile, it makes the Huns a lot better for rushing early game strats, whether it's war or not. Consequently, as Civ 5 is a snowball game, those who get ahead early tend to stay ahead, this makes the Huns very versatile. The Huns obviously get a 5 out of 5 for war, they also get a 3 out of 5 for culture, 3 out of 5 for diplomacy, and a 5 out of 5 for science. That is all from the fact that they can get early wonders and settlers out, it can grow and thrive all that faster. War in this game is also not domination victory or not. You can take the city of the guy who built Stonehenge or Parthenon and get those early cumulative advantages on top of the fact of also losing a potential competitor because their war is so cheap. The Huns get a 9 out of 10 for best impact and a 17 out of 20 for versatility. Their start bias, avoid jungle and forest, actually makes them quite versatile. Finally, they get a nice 10 out of 10 for miscellaneous, as there's dozens of strategies you can do with battering rams. The Huns end with a 52 out of 60 in S tier. Probably the best war civ in the game, and is arguably two of the best units in the game. The Netherlands are really hyped in the Civ community, as they probably have access to one of the best things in the game, polders. Polders are good, very good, but they're good in isolation. Let's see how the Netherlands play out in practice. So, polders are a tile improvement that go over marsh and floodplain tiles. They cannot go over marsh or floodplain tiles that have other resources there like sugar. You unlock them at guilds, which is a fairly good tech, since it also gets you trading posts and Machu Picchu, which tend to be pretty uncontested. It comes in right around the time people are getting civil service, however, and unlike them, you don't immediately get the bonus upon researching it, because then you have to start building the polder, so it comes out a lot later than it seems. Polders provide plus three food, and when you research economics, they provide plus one hammer and plus two gold. That's amazing. That means marsh tiles are four food, one production, and two gold, and floodplains are the same but with five food, and maybe even one faith for desert faith. The issue lies with the fact that marshes are very, very rare, so you can seldom build these, and settling in deserts is almost always detrimental minus one, maybe two cities. Consistently, polders make few appearances but are nice when they do, but very, very rarely can change the politics of a game. Across your empire, you'll maybe have three polders on a consistent basis, and you may occasionally reach five-ish. Five of these are nice, but look at this versus the Huns. The Huns get permanent production on pastures from the start of the game, and there'll be plenty of pastures for them. If a polder versus a farm, is that a marsh tile gets one more food, one production, and two gold, instead of the one extra hammer for something you'll have dozens of, I'd much rather the production from pastures since there's just way more of those. The polders are just too inconsistent and they come out too late to make an impact. If you could build polders with construction or pottery, these would be a lot better, but they don't come out until so late, 
and when they do it's hardly as impactful as other bonuses this game gets unless you're really lucky. Civ 5 is already a game like Fortnite where you need to adapt to unique surroundings each time you play it, and the Netherlands give the player only one extra option to do so in a bad scenario, versus someone like the Maya or even Siam who can adapt with a bit of work. No matter how much work you put in, you can't change bad luck with the Netherlands. The Netherlands have a privateer replacement that I quite like. Privateers start with a bonus toward cities, but this unit starts with two promotions toward cities and can also heal wherever, rather than only friendly territory. Naval warfare is usually won by frigates, not by privateers, but this unit gets what I wish Japanese units had. If you build an armory and a barracks, you can start with logistics for very little investment versus what it normally takes to get logistics, and can move and attack with these, making them the horsemen of the sea, because when these roll out, naval armies tend to not be very big, makes them great at attacking cities. Have a privateer go in, move out, heal up, and cycle with another. With just a few of these, you can sweep enemy cities, whereas with frigates, you would need to resupply and constantly get new ones if you're warring, as they're prone to enemy fire and will likely die. These units are also great at kamikaze. However, in order for these to come in handy, you need to be coastal yourself, and your neighbor needs to be coastal, and your neighbor needs to be worth killing. Since this comes out, Right when the World Congress does, it'd be foolish to soil your name for the sake of a terrible city or two, so a lot needs to be set in place to make it worth. Albeit, that is true with frigates, but frigates were already good. This is the same strategy, but a bit cheaper in theory, since really the only extra hammers come from the barracks and armory, which at some point you're just going to have to build anyways. Much like the polders, if luck is on your side, the risks that come from the strategy are minimized. Some civs like England have options, but if it is not worth it to go to naval war, then this unit's not worth it. That being said, while I am undermining the Sea Beggar, it is still a unit that comes out with logistics if you do your card rights, and that is invaluable. Even the Chukanu is weaker than its replacement, but is worth more because of that reason, so something that is the same but better with logistics on an already alright unit is very nice. Compared to the Siege Tower, it's easier to use, is less costly, you still need plenty of military with the Siege Tower, and it does the job better. The Netherlands ability is the Dutch East India Company, which, if you trade away your last copy of a luxury, you keep two happiness. This can be used to get We Love the King Days, but that's about it. Normally to get those, you'd have to trade something to the computer and give them four happiness while you get none, but this is not the case. It is not worth it to do that in general, because while you get two happiness, the computer gets four. So really, only do this if it's a We Love the King Day, unless you're in a pinch for some temporary happiness. You don't want to help the enemy more than you after all. The downside is that in order to do this, the computer wants to trade with you, it has extra lux, and it's the one your city wants. Just like the other two bonuses, if luck is on your side, you can take advantage of the situation, but otherwise it's worthless. It is less luck dependent than the other two I find, but when do you see Babylon being like, man I hope I can get a great scientist? No, they always get a great scientist, but you don't always get We Love the King days, which is unfortunate. The Netherlands get a 3 out of 5 for war, 3 out of 5 for science, and a 1 out of 5 for culture and diplomacy. This is exclusively due to the fact that they can grow somewhat reliably and have a nice naval game, but that doesn't win games on its own. I give them a 4 out of 20 for adaptability, and a 3 out of 10 for best impact, which can happen with a coastal empire. They really don't excel at one particular playstyle, they are fairly dependent on the land, and then we'll make an assessment. They get 10 out of 10 for miscellaneous as they have mad potential, but it's rare. Although, consistently, they'll just get a little bit of potential. Something's bound to happen every game for their bonuses. This gives them 25 out of 60 in C tier. Ouch. If you've watched any kind of video about the meta of Civ 5, you've probably either watched Filthy Robot or Baba Yaru. They're pretty much the only two Civ 5 content creators that I know of, and both they had the opinion that Venice is utterly terrible. However, they play the game with other humans and not the computer. Against the computer, Venice is the key sieve that takes advantage of exploitable game mechanics that otherwise should not be possible. Before I begin, I would like to note that Venice is amazing on Archipelago, but that's unbalanced, so Continents is fine. Even on Pangea they're good, but Continents allows for more isolation, which is really what Venice needs. So, Venice is really weird and really gimmicky. Basically, they don't settle cities and they get double trade routes, and can obtain city-states with great merchants where the city-states are puppets. They can also buy stuff in puppeted cities, and they could never annex any city ever. 
they get a free merchant at Optics. Basically, in theory, the Venetians accumulate a bunch of money and can buy stuff in the puppeted cities they would otherwise build in, and if need be, they can control the city-states with their merchants. Controlling city-states is a mixed bag, because while you increase your land, you lose out on a potential ally just like Austria, and city-states are also usually in less than ideal locations, often accompanied by just one luxury. Sometimes they have natural wonders though. What is really unfortunate is that Venice should be making great merchants, what makes it harder to generate great scientists to win you games. But if you don't make merchants, you miss out on a huge pool of potential given to Venice and will likely fall behind. That part's a lose-lose. What is not a lose-lose is the number of trade routes and the ability to purchase in puppets. In my game as Venice, I accumulated nearly 100,000 gold, which can basically let you do anything. You can also annex and annex and annex city-states and then feed the city of Venice nonstop with the absurd number of trade routes. The big downside from this is that by not settling lands, you give the computer more land to settle and basically just create a powerhouse of an AI, which is why continence is more important since there's less land for them to take control of. But basically, by getting so much gold, you can ally literally every city-state, control the congress, get all the benefits of all the city-states, and can buy an infinitely sized military. You just create a huge hurdle to overcome in the process. Venice is kind of like playing the game on hard mode, but then you're also given tools to overcome it, so then it's easy mode. It's really weird. Also, the Great Merchant of Venice, which ties in with their ability, if you decide to just do a normal merchant trade mission, you get double gold and double influence. It's a bit redundant since the trade routes already do that, but it can be better if all of the trade routes are being used for food and production. Venice has the Great Galeas, which is a super strong Galeas. I really tend not to enjoy Galeases, but I actually enjoy this quite a bit. Much like the Netherlands, you need a coastal neighbor who is strong enough to make it worth your time to build these, but they're also great at defending your trade routes far better than a trireme. Overall, it just ties in really well with Venice's double trade routes. If that superpower you happen to make has some coastal cities, it is worth it to take them out with these, assuming that you've accumulated enough gold to buy these on a whim by the time the medieval age rolls around. With Petra or Colossus, or both, you should have over 10 trade routes at this point, or near that number, so you're probably making near 100 gold per turn by this stage of the game, meaning every few turns you earn a great Galeas and can wreak havoc in the seas however you want. Where Venice falls short is that in a real game with humans, you'll get killed before you can accumulate lots of money, or you'll have your trade routes routinely plundered. The former is not necessarily impossible with the computer, but the latter basically doesn't happen. By taking advantage of the dumb programming, Venice players can get tons of money, but at the end of the day, it's just money. It isn't science, and the only way to get science is to generate merchants, which then pushes back your scientists, and that's a bigger deal than it seems. Venice gets a 5 out of 5 for diplomacy, a 4 out of 5 for war, a 1 out of 5 for science, and a 1 out of 5 for culture. They get a 6 out of 10 for impact, where they go turtling and hope no one notices your 500 gold per turn. They're really not versatile at all. They get a 1 out of 20 for versatility, and a 5 out of 10 for miscellaneous. Really, Venice needs to do exactly one thing, otherwise you're boned. Even then, it's not a guarantee. Without a doubt, the weirdest sieve in the game, and I really don't like them for that. But in the eyes of how good they are in the game, they score a 23 out of 60 in C tier. It's too easy to get stomped, but if you can somehow hide yourself, which really just depends on your land and neighbors, you will succeed. You can't mention Mongolia without mentioning Arabia. The two have very similar unique units, and are usually head-to-head -head for which unit is best in the game. In isolation, the Camel Archer, but Mongolia has other aspects in their playstyle that bring a lot of synergy with one another, just like the Huns. So first off, the Ugly. Mongolia gets plus 30% combat against city-states and city-state units, which is near useless. Going to war against city-states is almost never worth it unless maybe it's a one-time thing, because city-states get mad if you keep declaring war on them, and those bonuses from other city-states are too good to pass up, so you can't afford for them to get mad. Everything else about the Civ is great. Mongol Terror gives Mongolian horse units plus one movement, which is basically the only thing to their ability that's a good one. Austria and the Huns have appealing horse units almost exclusively due to the faster movement. It's what makes horses good, and in a game where positioning is key, the ability to get even better positioning is highly valuable. Mongolia has the defining, game-changing Khan. This is a great general replacement that moves with 5 movement and gives units plus 15 additional healing when they heal. That's huge, 
and makes War for Mongolia powerful and non-stop. Not only do they have a constant Great General, because the horses and the Great General can keep up with one another, but they also heal at insane rates. Better than if they were in friendly territory. Or on defense, they heal 35 HP in friendly territory. With March, units are unstoppable, because the 15 HP stacks with March each turn. March is not realistic to get either, as the ability to heal and constantly go to war means promotions will come quick. I highly recommend going Honor and getting the faster promotions, as that is what will sooner get you March. Anyways, that is nice and all, but what makes Mongolia compared to Arabia? That is the Keshek, which is a knight replacement that is very similar to the Camel Archer in that it's a ranged unit that is not weak against cities. The Keshek trades some power and defense for 5 movements. It does not stack with Mongolia's ability, so the unit itself only has 5. It has Great Generals 1 and has faster promotions compared to the Camel Archer. Keshiks are very frail, they often get shot 2 or 3 times and die, whereas Camel Archers can take quite the beating. In isolation, Camel Archers are better and stronger, but both are very powerful move and shoot units. The Keshek, however, always has the Khan, and the two complement each other incredibly. The Khan is just as move and shoot as the Camel Archer, and the two can destroy enemies with ease. In fact, the downside of Mongolia is that they don't have a fast melee knight to capture cities for them because Keshiks just destroy everything. They do the actual killing slower than the Camel Archers, but the Khan makes up for it, and overall I think the two units act better than the Camel Archer by itself. Pretty much with good positioning, which can be done via the 5 movement, nothing is impossible with Keshiks. It's arguably the best unit in the game. Mongolia obviously gets 5 out of 5 for war. Keshiks really don't fall off until the industrial era, where camel archers instead are evenly matched. But they have no bonuses outside of war. I give them 1 out of 5 for science, 1 out of 5 for culture, and 1 out of 5 for diplomacy. They get 10 out of 10 for impact, for being the best at non-stop war, and war in the medieval era is fairly expensive, but you can reap massive rewards. I give them a 10 out of 20 for adaptability. If you need to kill an enemy, you totally can with relative ease. Mongolia also gets 7 out of 10 for miscellaneous, because I feel like they're way better than what these stats seem, there just isn't a lot of interpretation. You go to war, and that's it. Extra generals can help you nab territory, however, if you need to expand into opponent that, say, has the Great Wall, for example. In fact, Mongolia is without a doubt the best civ at killing someone with the Great Wall. The Keshek will spend two movements going forward, one shooting and two back, or it can use three going on rough terrain, one shooting and one back, which the Camel Archer cannot do. This gives Genghis Khan 35 out of 60 in B tier. Remember, war is costly. Winning war does not mean you win the game. Mongolia also gets a plain start bias, which more often than not has high production starts. Everybody says Rome is really good. I do not agree. I think they're pretty bad. Rome is so overrated, and they really suck in my opinion. They're better than France, but not by much, honestly. Some argue Rome is best as wide, and that is true, but they do nothing to combat the issues that come with being wide, and instead they only add to what's good about it. Being wide is already good in this game, it's just hard to do. Rome makes it even better, not to say by a lot, but does nothing to jump over the hurdle that is going wide in the first place. So, the benefits of going wide are decentralized production, meaning that you can have many okay cities instead of just a few good cities. For wonders, this may not be good, but you can get lots of military, lots of land, and a lot of just raw production across your empire for when the situation permits that everything needs to work on something ASAP, say trade routes or the World's Fair for example. Wide struggles with getting a lot of necessary infrastructure up, since the cities tend to build everything slower, but are more powerful when they do as a whole. Rome's ability, the glory of Rome, gives plus 25% production towards buildings if they exist in the capital. That really is not that useful. For critical buildings that need to be built ASAP like universities and public schools, this does not help wide empires if you hard build them in the capital, because while the capital may complete the public schools first, the other cities should still be building it in the meantime, and it may shave off like one or two turns when the capital is done. For non-essential infrastructure like amphitheaters, it's fine. But also, who cares about amphitheaters since they aren't essential anyways? It's a bonus to stuff you don't really want. Alternatively, you could just buy the buildings in the cap and then build them somewhere else, which basically equates to spend money and get a production bonus. And that's not bad, but it can't be expected out of wide empires regularly since they tend to struggle with money. For example, windmills are fairly essential and they cost 1800 gold. That's a big investment, and your money could be used on other things. It's tough to use, 
so instead this comes more practically in a tall empire, and compared to other tall bonuses it's hardly useful. With buying the buildings in the capital strat, you'll see two or three turns taken off most essential buildings when they roll out, and it's fine, but nothing game changing in the slightest. So, Rome may want to play tall instead. However, Rome gets two military units that play much like the Horse Archer in Batting Ram or the Khan in Keshik, and that they need to be used together. The appeal of liberty is how easy it is to get military out, and tradition, particularly in the early game, is hard to get consistent military out of. Rome has the Legion and the Ballista. The Legion is a swordsman that is 17 instead of 14 strength, and it can also build roads and forts. That's actually a very nice unit, much better than other swordsmen in this game, arguably the best. Having something stronger than a pikeman that comes out around pikemen is very attractive. What you do is rush ironworking, get some out, and use them to build roads in your empire to the cities that you're about to attack while you prepare the rest of the army. The unfortunate side of things is that these come at a time where the player really needs to make a lot of toss-ups to what to do. Should you get more cities? Did you build the National College? Did you go for some wonders like Hanging Gardens? If you're Liberty, did you get Aqueducts? This wouldn't be that bad if they could just be worth the risk, but a melee unit alone won't win you the push, and you still need to put a lot of hammers into range units. They're just a bit more unkillable, and since melee units jobs are to be blockade for your range units, it's good that these do it better. You can likely see these destroy combos if given the chance, but more realistically, they just allow you to put your ranged units into harder to reach locations, meaning the legions are better than normal swordsmen at pushing a defensive location. They don't make it a non-uphill battle though, and they just make it less likely that you'll lose the push. Meanwhile, Rome has the Ballista, which replaces the Catapult. The Catapult is a very, very bad unit. It's incredibly weak, and it needs to set up to shoot. The Ballista gets a little bit of strength, a 14% increase, and a bit more ranged attack strength, a 25% increase. I find that extra defense makes a difference, and the Ballista consistently hangs on with the thread rather than to be obliterated in one hit like the Catapult. That's nice, it helps you fight uphill battles better, like the Legion, but if the terrain is not very defendable, just go with combos anyways. Their ability to not set up is more valuable at killing the enemy army, since Legions should not do 100% of the attacking, and the Ballista is bad at killing the army. When the army is dead, only the city remains. In hard to traverse terrain, siege units are better, since every unit is basically stop and go, and your only target is the city. Ballistas are also better than combos and the Great Wall, but not by much. So they get a situational niche, and convince you to use them less than the Legion convinces you to use it. In the early game, making a risk by going to war and losing is detrimental, and these don't minimize the risk that is early war but give you more options to where you could take the risk. If you weren't going to win the push before, you aren't now unless it's defendable, but you still need to play the cards right. Compared to the Indian War Elephant, this is way less valuable. Rome's ability is overrated, and Rome's military is overrated. The only saving grace is the Legion and its road building, as it works well with the Ballista until you enter enemy territory, which 99% of the time will happen if their borders expanded. The Legion also has a big opportunity cost associated with it, as you have to research the tech for the Colossus, so it may seem enticing to go for the Colossus, but then you aren't building Legions. But if you build Legions, you don't compete for the Colossus. And if you do either of these, you aren't making a National College or a Great Lighthouse or something. I give Rome a 3 out of 5 for War, a 1 out of 5 for Science, a 1 out of 5 for Culture, and a 1 out of 5 for Diplomacy. They get a 3 out of 20 for adaptability, since they can adapt to some situations that may arise in the classical era with war, and a 5 out of 10 at impact, since the Legion can be powerful, albeit the opportunity seldom occurs. Lastly, I give them a 1 out of 10 for miscellaneous, since they really have nothing special about them that may pop up. Rome gets 15 out of 60 in D tier, only saved by the Legion, which still has an opportunity cost associated with it. The Siege Tower is just better than the Ballista straight up, and the Siege Tower is not even that amazing. Russia, unlike Rome, has a production bonus that is always very relevant and very nice. Russia also has a much more relevant melee unit, and I say is pretty similar to the Huns, honestly. They're fairly versatile, but also do not have a cut and dry playstyle, so they aren't particularly amazing at one thing, but they're just pretty good at everything, kind of like India. In fact, Russia is very similar to India, but instead of growth, they get production. The melee unit in question, probably one of the most underrated units in the game, is the Cossack. 
This unit is okay, it becomes completely game changing with either Brandenburg or Alhambra, or is probably best unit in the game with both. Basically, the Cossack is a cavalry that gets plus 33% combat towards wounded units, but this stacks with charge, meaning they get plus 66%. So with one of the two aforementioned wonders, you can get these coming out with charge, and with a single artillery shot or some kind of range shot or something, all units, as long as they aren't at 100 health, now take 66% extra damage. Now, if the Cossack is able to get Blitz, which is easier with those two wonders, its double attacks are worth more than most double attacks, as the first attack softens up the enemy for a plus 66% attack. Cavalry are probably the only usable melee unit in the Industrial Warfare, and these and artillery are exclusively what you need to win a push. Compare this to the Maori Warrior, which is a permanent 10% bonus on enemies, but this one gets 66% on enemies for doing what you're going to do anyways. It also still gets the drill promotions. With either of the two wonders, it's rather unfortunate. The Cossack is still usable and instead only gets a 33% bonus, which is fine. It's basically double rough terrain bonuses towards everything, but really having the 66% is like the autocracy tenant that gives permanent damage to all military units for 50 turns. Just a better bonus and only on cavalry. Universities to military science is a legitimate strategy as the path opens up great opportunities like Linian Tower and the production from chemistry, but it comes with some risks, the biggest of which is not getting public schools and windmills. But it does not need to be a rush, because head to head they're still fairly great and unlike say the Ballista and the Legion, which do not have enough of an advantage to completely decimate enemy armies. Also compare this to the Musketeer, which gets a 16% bonus, and this gets a 66% bonus in almost all scenarios, and the distinction of why France is so bad becomes clear. Russia has the worst building in the game, the Creepost. Well, actually, it's not the worst building in the game, but it's the worst building in the game in terms of just its bonuses and isolation. Another building in the game is worse because it's worse than the default building, and while this is better than the default, it isn't by much. It's a barracks replacement that reduces the gold and culture cost for expanding borders. Barracks are not built when you research them. They're built when you're already ahead enough to implement them into your army, which may be industrial or renaissance, so having your borders expand by then is basically useless. The only time this makes an impact is if you conquer cities, have Anchor Wat for whatever reason, and use the border expansion to make easy citadel placements into future enemy territories. The creep post and Anchor Wat is actually a nice combo that doesn't seem good at first, but it's such a high bonus that becomes comically effective. But this also means you need to build Anchor Wat, which is another high risk, low reward playstyle. Russia is the only sieve I would say Anchor Wat is worth building on, and that's because the combined minus 50% cost makes your borders reach the max expansion far before the end of the game, which may help you reach some out of reach luxuries or coal faster, but really, it's just kind of hard to measure how impactful it is. It's pretty good on most Liberty and some tradition cities, since Liberty has slow border growth, and if somehow you have the production for Anchor Wat and Creepost, then it's worth it, but otherwise it only exists for the funny factor. Russia also has one of the better production bonuses, maybe behind Germany, but is easier to pull off, Siberian riches. Horse, iron, and uranium provide double quantity and provide an extra hammer each. So I could be mistaken, but I don't believe this production applies to other strategic resources like coals, only the three I mentioned, despite what the game says. Please correct me if I'm wrong. Anyways, the double on iron makes little difference, but the double horses help great with Cossacks if you're short on horses, and the double uranium is amazing for nuclear plants and nukes. Uranium is very hard to come by, and double of it is much appreciated, setting the stage for a makeshift production via a nuke plant. Really though, the extra production is where this shines. Early game, this is comparable to the Huns, but the Huns need to actually improve the pastures to get the production. Russia doesn't and going early on for bronze working and for animal husbandry can probably save you time on some wonders than if you just went for the wonders straight up. For example, animal husbandry to pottery to sailing to optics could build you a faster great lighthouse than if you just went pottery sailing optics if you were in a game where optics was important. Alternatively, bronze working is on the way to the Colossus, another great wonder, and Russia, in a way, gets a bonus to that with the extra hammer on the iron. Early game plus one hammer makes a big deal. I don't think this is better than the Hanuk ability for pastures, since there tend to be more sheep and cattle than iron, 
and both get the ability for horses, but the need to not actually improve the tiles for production is game-changing. Russia gets one food, five hammer tiles with improved horses and a stable on planes, or two food, four hammers, and having that available in the classic era also means Machu Picchu, Notre Dame, and Chichen Itza are easy pickings for Catherine the Great, compared to other civs who probably have two food, two production, or two food, three production horse tiles and no stable. Building the stable is also worth it, even if the only pasture is a horse tile, because you get the hammers towards your future Cossacks and it pays for itself. Alternatively, get your essential techs up, maybe some workers, and spam settlers out non-stop. After all, you get liberty time settlers with tradition, so why wouldn't you? And God forbid Russia goes liberty and gets even more early game production. Russia is a great overall sieve, and I think is pretty close to a balanced sieve, maybe leaning on the powerful side. Cossack is great if you put in work, Creepo sucks, and the ability is always amazing. They get 5 out of 5 for war, 3 out of 5 for science, 3 out of 5 for culture, and a 2 out of 5 for diplomacy. Production is pretty versatile, and it's very helpful with science and culture infrastructure, but it's really not worth getting city state allies unless they request wonder or trade routes. Obviously production is also best for war, since war is just the measure of who has the best timing combined with hammers. Russia gets a 17 out of 20 for adaptability. Since they spawn in the tundra, which is actually a downside and nerfs them. This is because poor growth, or they spawn with few directions they can expand into, otherwise they would probably have higher adaptability. They get an 8 out of 10 for impact, which can happen when going wide, but much like Rome, they don't have direct bonuses to counter the downsides. Unlike Rome, they can afford to build workers and settlers faster, meaning they get luxuries and forward settle faster, which is actually what going wide tends to struggle with, as normally you should be waiting for collective rule. But Russia can go wide as tradition, can do liberty, or even both sometimes. I get them 6 out of 10 for miscellaneous. Production is pretty good, but there's no cheese with that. They still don't have bonuses to growth, so their specialist slots depend on the land just like anyone else's. And if you can't grow, then you can't win. I also did not mention this, but early production can sometimes get you a strong religious game. It's just less good than someone like Ethiopia. Russia gets 44 out of 60 in A tier. The Iroquois are often considered the worst civ in the game by many, many people. That's because their unique building has measurable, consistent, notable downsides to its replacement. They are definitely bad, because this downside is a huge deal. It's not like an amphitheater replacement not having the one culture. This is something that affects the game constantly. Meaning to many people, if the Iroquois had no unique replacements, they would be better than they are now. So, this infamous building, and probably the most famous building in Civ V, is the Longhouse. This is a workshop replacement that removes the plus 10% production that comes with the workshop, and instead provides plus 1 from every forest tile in a city. So, forests, more often than not, need to be chopped, as there's a luxury under them, they're on a river, or you're building a wonder, and that plus one hammer from each forest should not convince you to not chop it if it's essential that it gets chopped for a better city. Because of this, the Iroquois are constantly in a state of, do I want better tiles that aren't forests, or do I want production? But other civs can always get both. In a city with 20 production, which is very small, you will need at minimum three forests to make up for the loss, which is actually pretty unrealistic. I find that at best I have three forests, but usually less. Building this isn't optional either, as the workshop is mandatory to make a factory, so the Iroquois are always at a loss, never a situation where they weigh the opportunity costs. What this building does do is make forest hills, one food, and four production, where normally those become four production tiles, but the one food does not make up, and a forest hill, the best case scenario is even more rare. And also, if you go order, then you're still losing out on the production via the five-year plans if you build lumber mills on forest hills rather than mines. Just absolutely terrible. The Mohawk Warrior is something I actually kind of like, but that's just me personally. Basically, this is a swordsman that does not take iron, which is pretty nice in some rare scenarios, and gets plus 33% combat in jungles and forests. Unfortunately, even if a swordsman is amazing, just like the Legion, it does not convince me that the Civ is viable because of it. Swordsmen are just not useful units. Pikemen are easier to get to, are stronger, but at least like the pikemen, this unit is a bit spammable in theory because of its lack of an iron requirement. 
I find this unit is excellent on defense because by the time this comes out there's still plenty of forests and the Iroquois tend to spawn in forests and on offense if you can get woodsmen which is basically impossible they do a lot of damage more than the legion can dream of. Also because of the lack of the iron requirement you can zerg rush with these by immediately going for iron working and building warriors while saving up money. Each one takes about 100 gold to upgrade so with between 4 and 500 gold save you can decimate armies that are basically in the ancient era. Although, if Ancient Era Wars were ever a risk, it would be this scenario. The appeal of this unit is that there are a few prereq techs for it, making it analogous to the Berserker with how rushable it is, but the unit it replaces just is not too useful where it falls. If this was a pikeman, it'd be a lot better, but some strategies can come into play if you have an enemy you need to kill before they get the Great Wall or something of the sort. Lastly, the Great Warpath is an ability that thankfully the gods of Sivmire have fixed, when this game came out, the ability was terrible, but now it's less terrible. All units, whether citizens, military, or caravans, move through jungles and forests in friendly territory as if they were roads, and these tiles act as roads for city connections. In the past, they did not work as roads over rivers, but now they do, which is nice. This will save you a handful of road tiles, especially because you tend to keep jungles, which over the game can save you anything from 4 to 10 roads you have to pay for. Unfortunately, unlike the Inca, it's only friendly territory, so really it's not as usable as it sounds. Like, yay to some money. Germany has the same money-saving ability in a way more practical sense, and even then it's hard to measure how much it affects the game. If all units move through forests and jungles like Flatland, much like how the Inca do with hills, this ability would be game-changing, but as it stands, it just really doesn't affect the game too much. At least, it isn't useless like it was when the game launched. Hiawatha, unfortunately, only has one relevant bonus, and it's super niche. I don't think he's worse than Japan, who has such negligible bonuses that they don't help at all, but he's close. I'm gonna give him 1 out of 5 for every victory type. The lack of production does not help at all. Hiawatha gets 1 out of 20 for adaptability, 1 out of 10 for miscellaneous, and 2 out of 10 for impact, because in a perfect world, the Iroquois have a ton of 1 food for production lumber mills, and that just never happens, but it is technically possible. This is a total of 8 out of 60, landing him in E tier. It's hard to say who's worse, Japan or the Iroquois, but the Iroquois at least have some scenarios that are opened up to them that other civs cannot do with much ease, albeit they're seldom game-changing scenarios. Japan has such negligible effects on the game that you can go the whole game and never use their bonuses, while the Iroquois have small bonuses that do pop up, and just a big downside. Honestly, calling whoever is the worst just falls down to preference at that point. Many consider Egypt to be the best wide sieve in the game. Many also consider Egypt to be the best turtling sieve in the game. And consequently, many consider Egypt to be the best sieve in the game. Let's look at why. Egypt has three amazing unique parts to it. Firstly, they have the burial tomb, which replaces the temple. Typically, a temple is two faith and costs two gold. This is two faith and costs no gold, and it provides plus two happiness. This is very similar to the mud pyramid mosque on Songhai and the Kaido Hall on the Celts. When going wide, religion is key, it's one of your strongest assets, and happiness is hardest to come by. So, by building something that benefits your style of play the most, you now get no gold downside to it, and you get happiness, which are two of Liberty's biggest weaknesses. Alternatively, you could play tall for similar reasons to Songhai. It makes Egypt extremely adaptable, and is not at all a niche building like the Keitel Hall. This is always relevant and will always impact the game for the better. Egypt's unique unit is the War Chariot. It is fairly better than the Chariot Archer, which was already a very good unit in the first place for how cheap it is. This unit does not require horses, and it's also given plus one movement. Unfortunately, it still loses all movement if it enters rough terrain. I don't really need to explain why this is better than the Chariot Archer, but the reason Chariot Archers are so key is because they're the cheapest hammer to damage ratio at this stage in the game, and they come out very quickly. This lack of horses now also makes the unit spammable, which before was one of the bigger downsides to it, and it can now reinforce better with the extra movement. It does everything it does before and more. Combined with the early game happiness, Egypt can afford to warmonger if they want. Lastly, and arguably Egypt's best benefit, is the ability Monument Builders. Simply put, Wonders get plus 20% construction towards them. It makes Egypt very customizable, 
and you are less at the mercy of your lands as a result. Going wide has a bigger loss mitigated with this bonus wonder production, as production towards wonders was one of the biggest downsides of going wide, and going tall means you get a very large production bonus towards wonders, since your cities will probably have production specialist anyways. Or, if you're behind, this can help you score something in a pinch. It's just absolutely amazing. Egypt was one of the two sieves I mentioned far earlier that is contender for best wide sieve in the game. I'm unsure if the number one slot belongs to Egypt or the other sieve I've yet to cover, so I'll let the viewers of the video decide. I give Egypt a 4 out of 5 for military, 5 out of 5 for culture, 5 out of 5 for science, and a 5 out of 5 for diplomacy. They get 19 out of 20 for adaptability, and an 8 out of 10 for impact. And last of all, I give Egypt a 7 out of 10 for miscellaneous. This gives them a total of 53 out of 60 and puts them in S tier. Carthage has a unique unit that is similar to the Iroquois Longhouse, this being that in some scenarios the unit may actually be worse than if you just did nothing at all, and so having a unique unit is a detriment. However, unlike the Longhouse, this does not happen on a consistent basis, and it actually is more often better than it is not. However, what does it say about the unit if it's sometimes worse? First up is the Quinquarim, a Trireme replacement. If this video were made a few years ago, I would also mention this unit for being worse than what it replaces, but that's no longer the case. The Quinquarim does the same as a Trireme, but it's stronger. That's it. It has 13 strength instead of 10. This helps with tributing city-states, which the Trireme cannot typically help with, but besides that, it fills the roles of the Trireme all the same, which is defending your trade routes from barbarian ships and scouting. Very seldom, I have done this only a few times in my Civ career, you can take a city with just Quinquarims. You need to have six or seven of them, and it needs to have four or five coastal tiles you can attack from at once. That basically never happens, however. The strength's a nice addition, just isn't very impactful at all. So the actual unit in question for what could be worse is the African Forest Elephant. This replaces the Horseman and it has a lot of stats. For the good side, it has Great Generals 2 and the Feared Elephant promotion, which acts similar to the Maori Warrior promotion that gives enemies a minus 10% combat penalty if they're near the enemy. This unit does not require horses and it's 14 combat instead of 12. As for the downsides, it moves slower and it costs 25% more hammers. That last part is really detrimental in some scenarios. If you need a fast unit out quick, Carthage can't always do that. Thankfully, since this does not require horses, you have more horses for cherry archers, but sometimes you need a fast melee unit. Anyways, when that scenario does not arise, the forest elephant's okay. The production holds it back from being very good. I like the minus 10% of this unit much more than the Polynesian unit. They are stronger and will be frontliners much more often. However, early war is costly, as I've mentioned a million times, and this in a way actually increases the cost. The scenarios it opens up that benefit the player come thin and it really does not incentivize early war more than before. I guess if early war was necessary however, you'll have a slightly powerful unit with you. But like I said, this may sometimes even be a detriment. It's really unfortunate. Carthage has a weird ability that I think exists only for historical accuracy called Phoenician Heritage. After the first great general, which, in theory, the War Elephant is supposed to help you with. Units cross mountains like flat terrain and lose 50 health if they end turns on a mountain. Please note that your autopathing will go through mountains, so you need to make sure to not let the units end turns on mountains because they'll do so automatically. But anyways, this is fine. It typically comes into play a few times a game, and in very rare scenarios, it can be a super good game changer. But I'm talking incredibly rare. Do not expect much out of this. What is instead more relevant is that Carthage also gets free harbors in all coastal cities. This is great because seaports are great, lighthouses are great, and harbors suck. However, in order to get a seaport, you need a harbor, so this saves hammer in that sense. It also immediately sets up city connections at the very beginning of the game, assuming there's a coastal connection. This is easily the best of Carthage's bonuses, and that is because it's fairly consistent. It really isn't game-changing. It's like a very smaller version of Germany's ability where it saves some passive gold over the game, but also some hammers. Consistent, and sometimes allows for early city connections which will then diversify the early game. That's really not as common as it seems, however. Carthage I used to really enjoy and I honestly don't like anymore. 
It was for their harbors, their only good part that's reliable. In a very rare set of circumstances, they help you accumulate gold via the free harbors and early city connections, but don't bank on that. I give them a 2 out of 5 for military, 1 out of 5 for culture, 1 out of 5 for science, and a 2 out of 5 for diplomacy. Carthage really can't adapt, and like I said, they get a detrimental unit sometimes, so I give them a 1 out of 20 for adaptability. Carthage, when warring and seafaring, can get good wars going on and gets a 3 out of 10 for impact. I also give them a 3 out of 10 for miscellaneous, since the mountains and harbors sometimes allow for nice passive phenomenon. That is a total of 13 out of 60, landing Carthage in D tier. Honestly, they'd be a lot better if not for the expensive elephant, it's just far too costly. Portugal was a sieve I have always thought was horrendous. Turns out that's only somewhat true. Part of the reason why they're perceived to be horrendous is because they encourage you to do something that you shouldn't. However, I realize that if you just don't do it, they're fine. Let's look at them. So, Portugal's ability is Mar Clausum, and it says, Resource diversity grants double gold in trade routes. So, typically, if you want to trade with someone, say, on a cargo ship, and they have iron that is improved, you would normally get 0.5 gold for each different resource. Portugal instead gets 1 gold for each improved luxury and strategic resource. This does not seem like much, and while it is hard to say how consistent something like this is, the gold you will get will never be enough to justify not sending your trade routes internally anyways. Internal trade routes are far too effective, and so sending trade routes for gold just isn't worth it. Late game, it might be okay, but one gold won't affect the game as much then. It just really never has a point in the game where it will help you. Furthermore, unlike Germany and the Zulus, the side income you make from this is hardly any compared to those bonuses. A specific set of circumstances have to arise, and you have to sacrifice an internal trade route just to get some extra gold. It's never worth it, in my opinion. Something that scales better with your map size and map type is Portugal's unique unit, the Now. It replaces the Caravel, it has plus one movement, and also, when next to a foreign tile, and this includes city-states, it can conduct an event that will give you some gold and give the unit XP once per unit. The amount of XP is pretty negligible, and since Caravels don't do combat anyways, it doesn't really matter. The gold is okay, nothing game-changing. Typically, especially in continents, you build nows to explore things, and this gets it done all the much faster thanks to its plus one movement. Then, when the unit is done, you go to a tile that's very far away from your capital, as this bonus expands with length, but adjacent to another civilization's tile, and you conduct the trade mission. You can regularly see yourself getting between two and 300 gold per now, which is great if you can afford to build them. It isn't enough gold to make it something you should go out of your way for, however, because they still cost hammers and they still cost maintenance. They have a pretty big opportunity cost with them, but if you're going to explore anyways, then it's some nice little extra gold. The best part about Portugal is their unique tile improvement, the Fatoria. This must be built in a city-state, it must be built on a land tile touching the coast, and it must be built on a tile that has no resource on it, so no wheat, or sugar, or horses, or anything. Doing so will grant you every strategic and luxury resource that city-state gets. This is absurd, because not only does it basically unlock every luxury that's in the game to you, it also gives you mercantile-specific luxuries like jewelry and porcelain. It really helps your happiness in a pinch, and when it rolls out, is guaranteed to get you a few We Love the King days. The set of circumstances to build it are specific, which I think balances it. Sometimes, you know, you get screwed over and the city-states are landlocked, or all their coastal tiles have resources on them, so you can't build it there, but you typically are able to build this on at least maybe 60-70% to 70 of the city-states in the game. And, since luxury resources are shared, you really only need four or five good candidates to build it in. What is absolutely horrible is that if you build this and then research coal or aluminum and that ends up being on a tile that you built the Vittoria on, the Vittoria will remain there on the map, but the bonus you get from it will go away, which is terrible. It's so foolish that that can happen. 
It makes Portugal a lot better on continents since there are typically a lot more coastal city-states. Portugal has one pretty good bonus and two mediocre ones. I give them a 2 out of 5 for military, 2 out of 5 for science, 3 out of 5 for diplomacy, and a 1 out of 5 for culture. The ability to get the happiness is nice, it lets you grow to an extent and get city-state allies if they have quests, but it's limited in how much it actually affects the victory types. Portugal, because the bonuses don't come out until way later in the game, and as I have said, the earlier the bonus is better because in theory it will have made a longer impact, has a pretty low versatility aspect to them. The early game always has you at the mercy of your lands and there's really nothing you can do about it. I give them a 5 out of 20 for adaptability. Portugal really does not have a specific way to play them that makes them more effective. The Fatoria only helps if you're screwed over and didn't get proper luxury resources, and even then that's later. So I give them a 1 out of 10 for impact. However, the Fatoria is obviously very helpful, so they make up for this with a 7 out of 10 in miscellaneous. This gives Portugal a total of 21 out of 60, landing them in C tier. They are not very good, and I think the ability could use some adjustments to make it better. Portugal, for example, would really benefit from the free harbors given in Carthage's ability. China is arguably the best wide sieve in the game, rivaled by Egypt. What China and Egypt have in common is gold benefits to buildings, which is something wide civilizations tend to really struggle with. China, however, really takes one of the best aspects of going wide to the extreme, compared to Egypt who has the unique ability a bit harder to take advantage of on wide playstyles. What makes China so good at being wide is all three unique aspects of the sieve. The most impactful is the library replacement, the paper maker. This costs no maintenance and also gives plus two gold, meaning in reality it gives plus three up from a normal library. Liberty tends to really struggle with gold, and sometimes the most optimal tech path when choosing Liberty is going for markets before libraries because it will be better for your growth and science overall. However, China doesn't need to do this. China can always get gold benefits, offsetting Wide's downside, and can get science routinely with other civs in the game. Consequently, this is a net gain for China overall. If China is on par with Golden Science but has more cities and more land in the early game, China's given a huge head start against other civs. Outside of going wide, the paper maker is still great. It is almost ideal to beeline for this. It is Golden Science in one. Getting a head start on either of those aspects really sets you ahead of the competition and can help counteract poor lands that may have not given you a lot of gold. China's unique unit, the Chu Ko Nu, is arguably the best unit in the game up there with the Camel Archer and the Horse Archer. What this crossbow replacement has is a weaker ranged attack, it's 14 versus the regular 18, but it can attack twice. This by the way does not stack with logistics. But anyways, this is absurd, because really it means it has a 28 ranged combat assuming you get both moves off. Crossbows are already extremely powerful units that deal a lot of damage relative to what's out there, minus maybe muskets, and a replacement for them is all the better. On offense, which I recommend going with because a lot happens in the medieval age and you can eliminate any runaway opponents at this stage in the game, the Chukunu destroys enemy cities and units. This unit also gets XP faster due to firing twice, so getting long range on it is pretty realistic if you have a barracks. It easily gives you the best unit on the map, so at that point the world's your oyster. The Chukunu also benefits from moving and shooting, so it can fire at an enemy and then move away. This comes into play more often than it seems, and it really gives you an edge over your opponent. I personally like this unit more than the Camel Archer, but I'm not sure if it makes it better. As a side note for why this helps Wide China, Wide excels at producing lots of military fast, and when the best unit of the era comes out at non-stop speed, it really overwhelms your enemies. Lastly, China has the Art of War ability. The Great General bonus is plus 30% combat instead of plus 15%, and Great Generals are earned 50% faster. The Great General bonus is pretty self-explanatory, and is extremely impactful. Compared to a crossbow with a regular Great General versus a Chu Kanu with China's Great General bonus, a crossbow would typically do 20.7 range to damage. 
The Chukunu does two 18.2 ranged attacks for a total of 36.4. That's a 75% increase. No unit in the game has nearly double strength. And that's just for the Chukunus. The 30% applies to everything, making China a force to be feared. The extra generals allow you to burrow deep into enemy territory with citadels, where a failed push before could now be won now that you have an upper hand on land. In fact, I think that really sums up all of China's bonuses. A failed attempt at first is now instead an upper hand for you. China is amazing at war, but war is costly in this game and it's risky. Of course, the risks are lowered quite a bit thanks to the stronger great generals and the Chukunu, but there's still the cost aspect. It isn't free to get Chukunus and war everyone, but it sure is fun. I give China a 5 out of 5 for military, 4 out of 5 for science, 4 out of 5 for diplomacy, and a 2 out of 5 for culture. Most of the points given to diplomacy and culture and science were because of the paper maker, but the extra citadels allow you to steal luxuries and natural wonders from your foes. China is fairly adaptable with the paper maker, so I give them a 15 out of 20 for adaptability. I give them 8 out of 10 for impact, but there really isn't much else going on, so they get a 6 out of 10 for miscellaneous. China gets a total of 44 out of 60, landed in A tier. They're an excellent sieve, I love playing them. Finally, I can talk about this. Pretty much one of the worst units in the game, Lancers, has three unique replacements. I just haven't covered any civs that have unique Lancers. Sweden, as you guessed, has a unique Lancer, and it's largely outclassed by China, where it acts similarly. Let's go over Sweden. So, this Lancer in question is the Hakapalita. Lancers suck, and basically any replacement for Lancers suck as well. The reason Lancers are so bad is because they get outclassed very quickly and are horse units that specialize in taking out other horse units. Besides knights, who are starting to become outclassed at this point, the only thing Lancers are good against is themselves. However, that's a double-edged sword and then they're bad against themselves. Furthermore, Lancers cannot fortify like pikemen, which is one of the best draws of that unit because it's a great blockade from horse units who try to attack your crossbows. A musketman is 4 less strength than a lancer, but can fortify and gets defensive terrain bonuses, so it's stronger in most situations. Yes, it may move slower, so lancers in some situations are better because of that. Even then, musketmen aren't really even that useful. The lancer is a bottom of the barrel unit. But anyways, all of that said, Sweden's unique lancer does not fix any of these problems. It receives a bonus if its turn begins on the same tile as a great general, where the Hakaplita will get 30% combat from the general instead of 15%. It also lets the great general move just as fast as it for that single turn. That's nice, and it's super situational. Since horse units are supposed to be on the flank to take out crossbows, your general will deviate from your army if you decide to use this, and it may end up doing more harm than good. If the horse units are on your front line, it's fine, and the plus 30% axe is fortifying in a way, so basically you can get a unit that can fortify in air quotes, but it sacrifices the rough terrain defense for extra movement. It's just not worth it at all. Sweden has another pretty useless unit, the Caroline, which replaces the rifle. As we discussed with Ethiopia and Denmark, Rifling's not a key tech because rifles get outclassed quickly. The Caroline starts with March, giving it plus 10 health even if it doesn't action, suggesting that maybe you want to use these for finishing blows. I suppose maybe that's the case, but infantry should be fortified and on defense most of the time soaking up hits, which March does not contribute to. Ethiopia's rough terrain bonus on their riflemen is far better than this because it helps with defending. March does help with your positioning a little, if for some reason you need Carolines on the flank, but cavalry do that better. I would recommend building these and then waiting until they upgrade into inventory or just skipping them entirely. What makes Sweden viable is the ability Nobel Prize. When Sweden declares friendship with a sieve, Sweden and that sieve get plus 10% generation towards great people. Sweden can also gift great people to city-states for 90 influence. So, the generation's amazing. Sweden can typically get plus 50% or plus 60% generation to great people depending on the map size. It seems to contradict the unique units because if you warmonger, 
you lose friends, and this is way more impactful than those unique units. The amount of great people Sweden gets is insane. I noticed a notable increase, and probably generated an extra 4 or 5 of each kind of cultural great person. After a while, particularly in the late game, engineers and cultural great people aren't that useful. That's when I would consider gifting them only at the end of the game, because it makes a slight impact, it doesn't really guarantee you allies until far later. If you somehow got generals, admirals, or merchants that you don't want, I would also recommend gifting them at any point in the game. The gifting part's fine, but really the generation is the best part. Compared to Austria, who has a great unique building thanks to the plus 25% great people generation, Sweden now gets even more if they play their diplomatic game correctly. Sweden gets a 1 out of 5 for war, 3 out of 5 for culture, 3 out of 5 for science, and a 3 out of 5 for diplomacy. Sweden unfortunately spawns in the tundra, and that's a huge nerf. I give them 9 out of 20 for adaptability, it would be lower, but the great people generation is just superb. They get a 4 out of 10 for impact, it can sometimes be pretty hard to please your AI friends, and this ability scales with map size. Since most games people play are 6 to 8 players, sometimes it's not too impactful and will only be a 20 to 30% increase. Also, Sweden can go patronage at the end of the game, after finishing rationalism, and get extra great people from city states, which is a fun bonus, but just nothing crazy. This gives them 6 out of 10 for miscellaneous in my opinion. Sweden gets a total of 29 out of 60 in C tier, close to B. The units suck, don't use them. Use the friendship bonus instead. The Aztecs are basically the only Civ in the game that can reliably go honor. The reason honor and piety are not worth it compared to tradition and liberty is because the latter two policy trees have bonuses to production and growth, which will help you snowball more reliably. Furthermore, it's seldom worth it to do a mix of policy trees because upon finishing one, you get a free unique policy to that tree so there's incentive to stay within one tree. Honor's finisher just isn't impactful enough to compare to liberty or traditions. Anyways, the Aztecs have the ability Sacrificial Captives. This gives you culture for each enemy unit killed, the culture being equal to their combat strength. So, if you open honor, you get a culture bonus versus barbarians, meaning that you can get double culture equal to the combat strength of every barbarian you kill. What this does is speed up your policy game early, but eventually does slow you down as culture per policy is exponential. However, early game policies are typically more impactful than later game ones, so I do think it's worth it. I would say open tradition or liberty, then open honor, and then finish the first tree. This also helps quite a bit more with empires that tend to struggle collecting culture. Outside of barbarian hunting, the culture is a nice chunk of change and will definitely help you get a few extra policies if you are warring. Compare this to the Brazilian infantry or the American musketmen. Those units get golden age points on kill, which is worse for a variety of reasons. Firstly, it's that that unit should be doing the least amount of killing and it has to kill in order to get the points. It's only at one point in the game, and Golden Age points always take a ton in order to get Golden Ages. With Sacrificial Captives, every kill gives you culture, and it definitely adds up. It's nothing crazy, but I really like this ability with Honor to give you a head start. The Aztecs have a unique warrior replacement, the Jaguar. This unit starts with the Woodsman promotion, which allows it to move faster in jungle and forests. It has a combat bonus in forest and jungle tiles, just like the Iroquois unit, and it heals 25 health if it kills a unit. This unit is only good for barbarian hunting, but it's really good at that. Warrior uniques really are not worth it because warriors are so weak, but I think this is one of the few warriors that is worth it if you go honor. Don't use it against your enemies because an 8 combat unit is just too weak to deal damage to cities. Barb hunt with this unit, that's it, because it's really good at that. The forest movement is nice because the Aztecs spawn in the jungle, but that also comes with the downsides of a low production start. The Aztecs have the unique building that replaces the water mill, the floating gardens. Unlike the water mill, this needs a river or a lake, not just a river. It has one less maintenance, gives the city plus 15% growth, and gives all lake tiles plus two food. So it may seem like you want to settle next to lakes to get the four food lake tiles, and that is very nice, but settling on a river is still just fine. As you can see, this has the bonus that the Temple of Artemis gives, and that's one of the best wonders in the game. 
The Aztecs are more of a science civ than anything because of how much growth potential they have thanks to this, and it stacks incredibly well with the Temple of Artemis. A lot of growth bonuses in this game work weird. The bonuses either take your surplus food and apply the modifier, or they take your base food before counting all of your citizens and apply the modifier. As far as I know, the Floating Gardens and the Temple of Artemis are the only two in the game that apply the modifier to the base food, which is insane. If you have 20 food and eat 15, the Floating Gardens gives you a surplus of 8 instead of 5, and that will let you grow all that much faster. So while it may be a 15% increase, you grow far faster than 15% faster. It's without a doubt the best part of the sieve. So, the culture and the jaguar are nice, they're fun little bonuses you can mess around with in some unique strategies, but then the Aztecs are given this insane bonus to food. Food in this game is directly related to science. You need food to grow, growth gives you population, and population gives you science. So there's more to meets the eye for the Aztecs. I give them 5 out of 5 for science, 4 out of 5 for military, 4 out of 5 for diplomacy, and a 4 out of 5 for culture. The Aztecs are customizable in a few ways. There are a couple of early game strategies you can go for, which are not mutually exclusive by the way, and they help you get ahead of the game if you're not too far behind the pack. And if you fall behind, there's really no downside to trying these. I guess the two downsides are the slow start jungle spawn, and that they need rivers or lakes in their cities. I give them a 12 out of 20 for adaptability, they're a bit dependent on the land, but the science really makes up for it. The Aztecs definitely get a 7 out of 10 if they get rolling, however, maybe outclassed by India since the Aztecs have no bonuses to happiness. Lastly, I give them an 8 out of 10 for miscellaneous, since science directly influences anything in this game, and the bonus culture really helps you. It actually is surprisingly good at stopping ideology dissidents. This gives the Aztecs a total of 44 out of 60 in A tier. They are definitely one of the better civs, and it really doesn't seem that way when you first start playing them. The Inca are like the Aztecs, but far better. Honestly, they're arguably the best civ in the game, but I personally would rank them maybe around the area, just not the best. They're also probably the most fun civ. They get rid of a lot of annoying aspects of the game. The Aztecs spawn in the jungle, as I said earlier, and that's a pretty bad start, but a great late game, which seems to contradict their early bonuses. The Inca, meanwhile, have the rare hill start bias. Firstly, what makes them so good is the terrace farm. This is a farm that's built on hills. It acts like a farm that gets fresh water and all that. What's nice is that for each adjacent mountain to this terrace farm, you get plus one food. So because of that, it's not rare to see terrace farms with four or five food in the classical and medieval era. This gives them insane growth, but they keep the insane hammers that come with working exclusively hills. The Inca are very rare, and that they can take lands normally unsettleable and create an amazing city out of it. It doesn't come out until construction, so maybe your second city might be a little slow, but it is without a doubt one of the best unique aspects in the game. The Inca consistently get huge food tiles, and heavens forbid the Inca get a desert hill Petra city. This works similarly to the Aztec's floating garden. There, I discussed how the floating gardens will give the Aztecs 3 extra food if they eat 15 and have a base of 20, so there's 8 left over. The Inca do not have a growth bonus like this per se, but what makes them great is that while their citizens may eat 15 food, the Inca more than likely have a total far beyond that and have huge excess. So, despite the floating gardens benefit to actual growth, the terrace farm is actually far better for growth than that as a result. The Inca, in tangent with the terrace farms, have their ability the Great Andean Road. When moving onto a hill, units ignore terrain cost, and all roads on hills have zero maintenance and half maintenance on all other tiles. The Inca are so nimble that they can traverse the land with ease, and the bonus on this rough terrain comes into play way more often than you would think. No maintenance on roads gets rid of a huge downside of going wide, and the Inca are very flexible that they can do that. And what's even better is that Incan workers can just build roads on hills for no reason. There's no downside to doing it. It really helps you navigate your empire a lot more easily. The Inca, like no other civ, can mobilize their entire military because of this, and can aggress super easily onto other civs since there's no downside for stepping into any sort of hill tile. I think Songhai should have this with rivers and the Iroquois with forests, because it really would tie in with their other aspects. 
The Inca also have the lackluster archer emplacement, the Slinger. This isn't really too useful, purely because archers are so weak. It has this bonus that it will withdraw when attacked by a melee unit, so it moves away sometimes and takes no damage. That can actually be a nerf in some scenarios if the archer is trying to escort a civilian, which is really unfortunate. It seldom comes into play in a beneficial sense. And furthermore, they're also weaker than the archer defensively, so really it just makes them a horrendous replacement for a unit that was already bad in the first place. The Inca get a 5 out of 5 for science, 5 out of 5 for military, and 5 out of 5 for diplomacy, and I give them a 4 out of 5 for culture, as terrace farms are just too good when working with their ability. They get 19 out of 20 for adaptability, as they can settle lands like no other Kusiv, either just due to it being mountainous, or their ability giving them a hand, or both. They get a 9 out of 10 for impact, and a 9 out of 10 for miscellaneous. This is a total of 56 out of 60 in S tier. They're so good. They're a great Civ. I was blown away when I first played them, and I continue to be blown away. Every now and then you get something crazy like a 9 food, 4 production hill tile due to a river in Petra, and that's just insane. They tend to be a bit better on Pangea, I find, since larger mountain ranges tend to occur there. Greece is incredibly fun. They have an incredibly underrated ability and can do things like no other Civ. I think they're one of the best Civs for learning the game. Greece's ability is Hellenic League, which has city-state influence degrade at half speed, and if you are in negative influence, it recovers at double speed. Greece can also trespass in city-states with no penalty, and heal in all city-states as if they're friendly territory. So this is extremely flexible, and it helps you in an array of scenarios. In particular, I'll go over some of my favorite strategies. Firstly, Greece can demand tribute with virtually no penalty early game. One of the downsides of demanding tribute is that it takes forever to recover to positive influence, but that's really no more. Part of why this is attractive is because Greece's units, but I'll get to that in a bit. The early game golden workers really set you ahead of your competitors. And then secondly, Greece's religion is probably the most important religion in the game. If Greece opens patronage and has their religion in a city-state, the city-state doesn't lose influence at all. It's absolutely absurd, it's one of the best things in the game. Now, if you've played Civ before with the computers, you probably know that they'll do whatever they can to get the religion across the entire world, so you can't really get this on many city-states. At minimum, however, you can get one to two city-states, and usually three or four. And even if you aren't allies, this is fine, because you'll get constant friendship bonuses, or you can just wait until the computer loses influence, and then you'll become allies. It's really similar to Siam, where getting the city-states allow you to even get more, and then you just start snowballing. Without a city-state sharing your religion on epic speed, Greece still only loses 0.18 influence per turn, or 0.27 if the city-state's hostile, which is a fraction of what it was. In essence, if you lose only 0.18 per turn, your influence may as well be standing still in the first place. Greece has two unique units which fill similar roles. As a result, I think they're a bit redundant, but I digress. The companion cavalry is stronger and faster than the base horseman, and the hoplite is stronger than the base spearman, both by two strength. If early game war is a necessity, these will really help you overcome your enemy, and they're only rivaled by pikemen or classical unique units like the legion. What is more applicable, however, is demanding tribute from city-states. The hoplite in particular can be upgraded via a ruin and can come out super quickly with bronze working, and it will help demand lots of city-states. If you have the time and the production, build companion cavalry because they're just stronger anyways, but the hoplite still gets the job done. It really ties in well with Greece's ability. Greece has lots of potential to be good, and while it doesn't have any benefits to getting city-state allies in the first place, Getting a few city-states is not that hard anyways. Instead, Greece has benefits to keeping city-states, which I find is much more valuable. I give them a 5 out of 5 for diplomacy, a 2 out of 5 for culture, 3 out of 5 for war, and 4 out of 5 for science. The culture, luxuries, and food you may get from city-states will really help you grow. I give Greece a 6 out of 10 for impact. Wide civs can get lots of faith and will help spread the religion faster, or they can get lots of culture in a pure number sense and help get city-states that way. Greece gets a 13 out of 20 for adaptability, all thanks to their ability. They are unfortunate, however, in that you're boned if you can't get city-states, but really that doesn't happen. 
I give Greece an 8 out of 10 for miscellaneous. This gives them a total of 41 out of 60 in A tier. Getting 0 influence loss per turn is something that's just extremely charming to me. Pretty much every Civ with direct bonuses to science is a good Civ. Korea is my least favorite of the three direct science Civs, those being Babylon, the Maya, and Korea, but they're still really good. The difference between Korea and the others is that Korea can get way more science than the other two, but it doesn't come out until later in the game. The Maya can get their plus two science with pottery, and that's one of the first texts in the game. Anyways, this science bonus is called Scholars of the Jade Hall. Each specialist and every great percentile improvement gives plus two science, and each time you build a wonder or a scientific building in the capital, you get a science boost. So the tech boost is nice, it's usually like a quarter or a third off of a tech, and considering how many science buildings and wonders you build throughout the game, this can be somewhere between two or three free techs as a result. Korea with a great engineer can instantly get a wonder and a miniature science boost, as it's kind of like they popped a great scientist. It makes their engineers really valuable in that sense. The specialist bonus is way more impactful though. The earliest specialists you can work are writers and merchants in the classical era. Typically, you do not work specialists until universities, but Korea can do so early and face few consequences. You usually wait to work writers because if you work the culture, you don't grow, and growth means science. And you don't want to work the merchant slots for the same reasons, as well as great merchants delay great scientists. As long as you can work the merchant slots just before you generate a merchant, you can get some extra early science and some extra early gold. And then if you're working the writer slots, that's two specialist slots and it gets you to universities all that faster than if you just didn't work them in the first place. Once you're there, Korea gets similar bonuses to Babylon's academy if not more, making them better than Babylon at this stage of the game. So the science is nice and it's very impactful. I guess the downside is that you have to wait to unlock it, so for a while you're just at the mercy of your lands. Korea also has two really weird units that I think purely exist as gimmicks just to nerf them. The first is the turtle boat, and this replaces the caravel. This sacrifices its deep ocean exploring abilities, which every now and then is unfortunate, but keep in mind other units can still explore the ocean, and it instead gets an absurd amount of strength. This is the strongest boat at this point in the game, and it also comes out the earliest of the three new renaissance boats. What it does is it's great at annoying people. Seldom will these help on offense, but they're killer on defense and great at destroying navies or trade routes, pillaging sea resources, whatever. They're not amazing, a frigate can just enter deep ocean, but they really are annoying. They typically don't come into play, but can help if you happen to be attacked by boats for whatever reason. Korea also has the Hwacha, a trebuchet replacement. Similar to the turtle boat, it sacrifices its main gimmick for an insane amount of damage. This gets no bonus against cities, has less melee strength, but is nearly double the range strength, so it's 26 instead of 14. Just like the turtle ship, it's really annoying and it's really good on defense. The Carafel and trebuchet were not particularly amazing at offense, so don't let the lack of a trebuchet deter you from making a push if need be. It's excellent on defense, more than other units at the time usually, because of its absurd strength. It can make beelining for Notre Dame a good idea, as the ability to make Huachas is very valuable with that tech. It's nothing game changing, but it's just kind of fun. Also, you could argue it's better than the trebuchet on offense. It loses its 200% damage versus cities, but its higher strength means it gains a permanent 85% damage increase on everything. So, personally, I just dislike Korea more than Babylon or the Maya because Babylon's bonus comes out earlier and is instant, and it can also give you yields of a tile under it. You can see something like 8 science and 2 food, for example. The Maya's bonus is, with 4 cities, just as good as Babylon's, but then some of the science comes out even earlier, and they get extra faith. Korea's bonus takes a while to get going, but when it does, it's game-changing. I give them 5 out of 5 for culture, 4 out of 5 for military, 5 out of 5 for science, and a 5 out of 5 for diplomacy. I rank military slightly lower, because Korea really should be turtling and building wonders, not military, but they're still excellent nonetheless. Korea gets 15 out of 20 for adaptability, I see them as less versatile than the other civs due to the standard early game. You could compare Korea before universities to France for example. Korea gets a 10 out of 10 for impact, their bonuses are absolutely incredible, and a 10 out of 10 for miscellaneous. This is a total of 54 out of 60 in S tier.
I feel like I keep saying this, but England's another one of those sieves that has contenders for the best units in the game. There's Arabia, Mongolia, maybe the Huns in China, and England. What England has that these sieves don't is the best navy in the game. Naval combat in this game is very powerful typically. The sea is basically just an array of flat terrain, so numbers often win the battle. England has a lot of numbers, in air quotes, on its side. The first unit is the Longbowman, and it replaces the crossbow. It's the same, but it starts with an extra range promotion. Extra range is so powerful in this game. Artillery is one of the best units because it has its extra range promotion, and the longbow is like that except it's in the medieval era. As you may have noticed in this video, Arabia, Mongolia, China, and now England's units are best in the game and they all happen to come in the medieval era. There's a lot going on in this era and a lot of opportunity to be made. The crossbow and the knight are great damage to hammer units, the crossbow especially, and really that never happens in this game. More often than not, in order to get damage out, you have to invest a lot. England not only has replacement for one of the best units in the game, so it's already good by default, but England has to invest fewer hammers into the war. The longbow has a harder time dying since it can be out of range of enemy cities and enemy crossbows. It makes war a lot safer on England at a time when war is viable anyways. Furthermore, the range sticks with upgrades, so you can get two ranged Gatling guns. If you beeline for industrialization, which a lot of the time you do anyways, you can harass the enemy. Compare this to Korea, it has a 26 strength range unit that needs to set up. England can get something similar if they beeline essentially only one error later with these 30 strength Gatling guns, except now they don't need to set up. England's amazing unit is the ship of the line. It replaces the frigate. The frigate, just like the crossbow, is one of the best units in the game. I've already said why, so I'm not going to cover it again. What this does is it has extra sight, it has a ridiculously higher combat, both melee and ranged. With 38 range strength, it's stronger than anything that comes out in the era and continues to be a menace in later eras. 38 range strength is a 25% increase. Going back to what I said about numbers winning naval wars, these numbers really give England an edge, or on the surprise, they absolutely decimate players in the lead. Any player that isn't prepared cannot face these, and even if you're in last place, they can take out someone with ease. This is up there with the Camel Archer for the best unit in the game, but I think that's better because that can move and shoot and has more windows of opportunity. Naval units are less good than land, only because you're not guaranteed a naval neighbor, but you are guaranteed a land neighbor. They're still great regardless. England has the amazing Sun Never Sets ability. All naval units get plus two movement, and then England gets an extra spy. So firstly, the extra movement is pretty useful with your already amazing navy. It ties in really well with the shape of the line. What I personally like to do is build Galeases, which are already pretty good because of the extra movement, and then I upgrade them into ship of the lines. It's an instant surge in damage and it can take out any enemy. The extra spy ties in really well with your longbows, or it can just be used as a regular spy. What happens is, once you get your first spy, you instead get two. You can put one spy to typical spy needs, whether it be counter spying or whatever, the other spy can go into enemy cities and provide sight for the longbowmen. Alternatively, if that's not important, it can help sway elections in city-states. Or you can steal techs and counter-spy at the same time. To me, spies get progressively less useful as the eras go on, in my opinion. Since, really, you only need one or two to counter-spy, usually only one to spy on enemies if you still even need to, and then the rest are just for city-states. The earlier the spy comes out, the better. England is amazing and makes war not so expensive. That's great because a successful war gives you a big edge but requires lots of resources. They get a 5 out of 5 for war, 4 out of 5 for diplomacy, 2 out of 5 for culture, and a 4 out of 5 for science. Their bonuses can help if behind, and they almost always do, so it really helps them a lot in that regard, but they're still pretty land dependent just like any other civ. I give England a 17 out of 20 for adaptability. They get 9 out of 10 for impact, their units make such a big impact. I also give them a 10 out of 10 for miscellaneous because I feel like the other criteria just doesn't demonstrate how good England is. That's a total of 51 out of 60 in S tier. If the Camel Archer is better, why is England above Arabia? Because England has two units that rival it, so overall they're definitely better as a team than in isolation, and because England has a good ability and not just a relatively useless one. Spain is sometimes the best sieve in the game, but they're also the most luck-based as well. 
Basically, when a very specific set of circumstances arise, Spain is unstoppable. But they also have two horrible unique units that I just want to get out of the way first. So I'll make this quick. The Tertio that replaces the Musketman is more expensive but has a bonus against mounted units and is 8% stronger. It's okay, the extra cost certainly is not attractive. I find it does the job a lot less good than Lancers at Killing Knights, and if you remember with Sweden, Lancers suck. But it comes out quicker so I guess it could be upgraded into? Just the extra hammers on any unit are annoying. The other unit, the Conquistador, is supposed to be used to scout out lands no one has gone on. It has defense when embarked, it has extra sight, it has no penalty on cities, and it can found cities on land masses that you did not start on. However, it's more expensive. This is actually really unfortunate because knights are idealized for their cheap cost. The settling city feature is useless as you don't typically settle cities when it rolls out, let alone on other land masses. So extra sight and embark defense on a knight for more cost is really the only thing this unit has that impacts the game. The extra cost is a huge detriment, just really unfortunate. Now that the units are done, Spain has the legendary ability 7 Cities of Gold. If you discover a natural wonder, you get 100 gold or 500 if you're the first one to find it. Natural wonders also provide double yield to Spain, and Spain gets 2 happiness for discovering a natural wonder instead of 1. So what can happen is Spain can find a natural wonder, use the gold to buy a settler, and a settler on epic speed is 680, so you need at least 180 saved up, which is really easy to get, and then settle the natural wonder and get crazy yields almost instantly. Even something bad like Grand Mesa becomes usable, and wonders like King Solomon's Mind, El Dorado, or Lake Victoria completely make or break a game. Spain does indeed get up to 1,000 gold for discovering El Dorado. And then, with the Faith Pantheon, it gives Natural Wonders plus 4 Faith, but with Spain that becomes plus 8. It's absurd, it's incredible. The downside is that the set of circumstances that need to happen are few and far between. I personally find they happen more often than one might think, and even then, 100 gold is not that bad. You almost always have a Natural Wonder and you can hard build a settler for it anyways. That alone is a game-changing bonus. Spain can get crazy yields very early, and it's definitely worth it to build at least two scouts. And god forbid Spain gets Great Barrier Reef and gets a thousand gold, and then two tiles that provide four food, two production, two gold, four science, and eight faith each. Even then, the Great Barrier Reef is at worst a free 200 gold and four happiness just for finding it, and that alone is amazing already. Spain could be the best, but not always. This is going to be one of the weirdest ones that I rank. Spain gets 5 out of 5 for every victory type, a 4 out of 20 for adaptability, and a 10 out of 10 for impact, and then a 10 out of 10 for miscellaneous. I kind of feel like it speaks for itself. They have so much potential, but are so luck-based. If they don't get that insane potential, they're just okay at best. But even then, consistently, they can still get the gold and the happiness. That's a total of 44 out of 60 in A tier. Morocco, like France, has a Brave New World mechanic shoved down their throat. Morocco still has options, unlike France, though. They also feature the legendary double-edged sword Desert Star Bias, only shared with Arabia. So Morocco has the unique ability Gateway to Africa. This tries to pull people in with the Brave New World trade route mechanic, but falls short because trade routes in your own borders are just far more effective than sending them somewhere else. Anyways, each trade route to a different civ or city-state gives Morocco plus 3 gold and plus 1 culture, and then other civs get plus 2 gold for sending trade routes to Morocco. The issue is that trading something like plus 4 or plus 6 food for turn for plus 3 gold and plus 1 culture just isn't worth it, and by the time you stop feeding your cities, the plus 3 gold and plus 1 culture isn't worth it either. It's a pretty negligible ability, I would just ignore it the whole game. There is really never a situation where it comes in aid. I guess if you decided to send a trade route to a city-state, then you can get some extra culture and gold. Meanwhile, Morocco has the fairly good Casbah, a fort replacement. The Casbah can be built on desert tiles and provides plus one food, production, and gold. It really doesn't make flat desert tiles any good, but if you have Petra, flat desert tiles become fairly viable. Typically, Petra is only worth it with desert hills, but this opens up the playing field quite a bit. 
Besides that, they're great on all desert hills. I quite like the one food, three production, one gold tiles, and then a possible one faith if you have desert folklore. They open up a few situations, few, or if you go Petra, they really make your lands a lot better. Desert hills with Petra and a Kasba are two food, four production, and one gold. That's a great tile, enough to feed the citizen, because the citizen eats two food, and so that citizen is worth exactly one gold and four production. That's the best case, and consistently they're okay, just not amazing. Keep in mind, it is a fort, so it also gives defense. Speaking of defense, Morocco has the cavalry replacement, the Berber cavalry. Much like the Shoshone in Austria, this unit is good on defense, but is overall still a pretty good unit anyways. I say out of the four cavalry replacements, the Shoshone one, the Russian one, the Austrian one, and now this, either this or the Shoshone one is the worst. The Shoshone cavalry gets plus one movement, and this Moroccan cavalry gets plus 50% combat in desert, and plus 25% combat in your own territory. Desert is slim, so situationally it performs a lot better than the Shoshone one, but consistently not so much. Furthermore, in order to use the friendly territory bonus, you have to be attacked, which is never a good sign anyways. I find that this basically never comes into play, but I guess in an Omega rare scenario, Morocco gets a cavalry with plus 50% fort bonus, plus 50% combat, and a plus 25% combat in their own territory. Typically there is no bonus, or a somewhat uncommon plus 50% desert bonus. It's meh. Morocco needs a bit to get going, and it's not bad when it does get going, but it certainly is still outclassed. The bonuses are just pretty mediocre. I give Morocco a 1 out of 5 for culture, 1 out of 5 for diplomacy, 2 out of 5 for science, and a 1 out of 5 for war. Morocco gets a 7 out of 20 for adaptability, as typically they aren't adaptable purely by luck of the draw, but when they are, it's great, thanks to the Casbah. Morocco gets a 2 out of 10 for impact, and I consider turtling, so that way you can use all of their bonuses and then a 3 out of 10 for miscellaneous, since the Casba is nice with Petra. That's a total of 17 out of 60 in D tier. I kind of feel bad the way I rank them. They have good replacements technically, but just the bonuses are so inconsistent and not impactful, it really doesn't matter. I find it funny that the last two civs I have left to review have Lancer replacements. These two Lancers are marginally better than the Swedish Lancer, and one is actually pretty good in general. Still, Lancers are bad. The Ottomans, unfortunately, have replacements for two so-so units. The Sapahi, or however you say it, is the Ottoman Lancer replacement that has one extra sight, one extra movement, and no movement cost to pillage. What this is intended to be is a harassing unit, and the extra movement does make it fare fairly well against the Great Wall. The issues with Lancers still stick however, and this doesn't change the fact that they're still weak to itself and pikemen. However, the extra movement helps with flanks, and the extra sight comes in handy if there's a few hills. I think it's somewhat useful as a reinforcement unit, just it's still pretty bad in general. It has a small window of opportunity. I don't find the harassing mechanic comes into play too much, since they stop with zone of control just like every other unit. One might be able to get behind the enemy lines and annoy them, but that won't do much and it's rare anyways. So, while the bonuses are good, it's still on a bad unit, and it does not make it worth it to use the unit. The far better Janissary is a musketman replacement. I have talked over and over on muskets, so in short, their damage to hammer ratio isn't worth it. What this unit has is it has a plus 25% combat bonus when it attacks, and if it kills a non-barbarian unit, it heals 50 health, just like the Indonesian Swordsman promotion. The issue is that muskets really should not be doing the attacking because it puts them out of position, so it's a lot better to have them blockade and let your ranged units do the killing. In theory, the 50 health would mitigate some of the loss from being out of position, and it actually does do that. They're a lot better on defense than on offense I find, because being out of position does not put you in line at the enemy city. They're able to clean up some easy kills and surround the enemy. What you do with a blockade of Janissaries is kill an enemy and power through with full health, and then use the flanking bonus to accelerate the process of pushing them back. On offense, they're so-so, just like regular muskets. They're certainly not bad bonuses, they're arguably just as good as the Minutemen, but both minimize losses to positioning in different ways. The Minutemen has a lot of more opportunity than this one, and much like the French Musketeer, there really is never reason to build these. The Ottomans have the unique ability Barbary Corsairs. The Ottomans pay one-third the normal price for naval maintenance, and all melee ships receive the prize ships promotion, 
so they have a chance to steal enemy boats on kill. So, in this game, there are a few melee ships you can build. The Trireme, the Caravel, the Privateer, the Ironclad, and the Destroyer. The Privateer already has this promotion, so the person's only on four boats instead. Triremes generally don't do any killing, maybe some barbarian ships, which lets you get some triremes or galleys, the latter of which are a weak ship, specific to barbarians. So basically, this only applies to three boats where it actually impacts the game. It's fine, it's nothing amazing at all. As I discussed with England, numbers win naval battles, so the ability to get more boats is fine, it just doesn't come into practice that much. Naval combat is at its best by surprise, and naval combat doesn't get good until the Renaissance, so you don't even get a chance to use this ability until then. And even then, it's only a chance it will be used. So the prize ship's promotion is rare and will maybe help, but probably won't change the tides of battle at all, since you'll have privateers anyways. The maintenance is also pretty negligible. Your navy will range anywhere from 6 to 10 ships most likely, and it won't come out until the Renaissance. Assuming each ship has an average GPT of 2, this saves anywhere between 10 and 14 GPT. That's okay, but unlike Germany and the Zulus, this ability just has such a small window of opportunity. At this stage of the game, the Renaissance, 10 to 14 gold per turn really shouldn't be that big of a deal. It doesn't add up over the whole game like Germany's because you tend not to even build a navy sometimes. So just like the prize ship promotion, this makes little to no impact. The Ottomans are just like France, a great civ in real life that gets insulted in the eyes of Civ 5. I give them 1 out of 5 for culture, 1 out of 5 for science, 2 out of 5 for military, and 1 out of 5 for diplomacy. Their bonuses really don't do anything besides the occasional Janissary coming into play. I give them 1 out of 20 for adaptability because their bonuses don't come out until so late and they don't help you adapt and they don't help if you're behind. They get 1 out of 10 for impact as they're like the Iroquois where they really just don't excel even if everything comes into play. I do give them a 2 out of 10 for miscellaneous since Janissaries are good sometimes. This is a total of 9 out of 60 in E tier. And for the last sieve, we have Poland. Like I said, I did this in a completely random order. I ordered each sieve, 1 through 43, and then used a random number generator to pick which sieve I would review next. I think it's really funny that Poland's last, because Poland's the best in the game. They have three absolutely incredible features about them. So, because I just finished talking about lancers with the Ottomans, I'll talk about Poland's. The winged hussar is a lancer, and as you know, that's unfortunate, but this really makes the unit a bit more usable. Typically, lancers are only a little bit better against cavalry, and since cavalry are better against all other units more than the lancers, they are the preferred horse. This lancer could bring that into question, however, because it's 28 combat instead of 25. That means against a cavalry, instead of having strength of 37.5 with the plus 50% bonus versus mounted units, it has 42. 3 combat goes a long way, and it also starts with shock 1, which is one of the 3 units in the game that get a flat terrain bonus when it comes out. The other two are the horse archer and the samurai. Any kind of promotion is great because it lets you get more promotions faster, and thus getting something like march or charge or blitz faster. With a barracks and Poland's unique building, these can come out with charge. They also have extra sight and a weird bonus that is a bit hard to use. If it inflicts more damage than it receives, the defender will be forced to move a tile back. If it cannot move back, it takes extra damage. This is a bit hard to take advantage of, but can be a little useful if there's a river. On the flank, if these get behind the enemy, they can force the enemy into your lines and then you can get some easy pickings. It's still a lancer, but it really improves upon it. I say, unlike the Sapahi or the Swedish Lancer, this one is actually better than the Musketman. Poland's unique building is insane. It's the Ducal Stable, which replaces the regular stable. Typically, a stable costs 1 gold, but this costs none. And then, this gives all horses, sheep, and cattle plus 1 gold and plus 1 hammer. So then, it starts actually making you money. And then furthermore, it gives mounted units plus 15 XP. So, the best part is no maintenance and the gold. I'm unsure whether or not I should build stables if I only have one horse in a normal game, for example, but since I know this stable will give me one hammer and one gold instead of the normal one hammer for one gold, it's so worth it. Poland gets a lot of money from this and gets something crazy like two food, three production, one gold tiles regularly. Poland also spawns in the plains, so there's cattle, sheep, and horses galore. 
it is incredible. It ties in really well with the Winged Hussar, because with no other XP building, those units still come out with two promotions, but they can get three or maybe even four if you stack the buildings right. The only other Civ that can reliably do that is the Zulus, and aside from Impies, that's what makes the Zulus so good at war. Thus, it makes Poland lots of money and can give them a very powerful military if need be. Poland, lastly, has the best ability in the game, Solidarity. Every time you go to the next era, you get a free social policy. That means, in total, Poland's going to get seven free social policies, which is a whole tree and one more. And what is even better is Poland can immediately open rationalism upon going to the Renaissance. This means Poland can get an on-demand, permanent, plus 10% science boost way before other people. So a lot of times, it's just worth it to just beeline for some Renaissance tech and then start actually filling out the tech tree. Poland can do liberty and tradition, and when those combinations can get pulled off, it's deadly. It makes Poland so incredibly flexible, because if you think about it, each social policy is like a unique ability on its own. Poland gets seven free unique abilities, and this comes into play very early. The second you hit the classical era, you get a free social policy. Poland can go into the modern era, likely with rationalism already finished, and start filling out the ideology ASAP. It's so insane, it's easily the best ability in the game. It's always relevant, it's always game-changing, and it makes Poland so customizable. Poland gets a perfect score for everything. They get 5 out of 5 for each victory type, 20 out of 20 for adaptability, 10 out of 10 for impact, and a 10 out of 10 for miscellaneous. The social policy ability alone puts them on par with Babylon, if not better, but then they also get the best unique building in the game and one of the best units for its era? I have no idea how this got past testing, unless they're just okay with a super unbalanced sieve. Play Poland sometime if you haven't. They're a joy. They get 60 out of 60 in S tier. So this last part is more of an unscripted, like me giving my thoughts now that the video is over. I don't have a script, I have this piece of paper in front of me with some topics I wanted to discuss now that I can look at all of this and be done with it. So I've been working on this since June. I have been recording footage. I kind of just recorded it for no reason and then I decided I wanted to make a tier list because I've always wanted a tier list for single player. You probably have seen Filthy Robot's tier list on YouTube before. The one where he talks about it for multiplayer. It's a very good video. I've watched it tons of times. It's very mesmerizing. I love to watch it and hear what he has to say about the game. Um, this game, I said it twice in the video. It's like Fortnite. So I guess I could elaborate what I mean by that. Each time you play Civ, there's a couple situations of luck, like your lands, for example. If you spawn in the tundra with no resources, no growth or anything, blah, 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 you're just straight up going to have a harder time than the person who gets Petra with tons of desert hills and floodplains and mountains and undefendable cities and, and, or sorry, defendable cities and just tons of wonders. That is like, that's probably the biggest deciding factor for how you do well. So really what these sieves are ranked at is kind of just in general, you know, given a random set of circumstances, how do you judge them? In Filthy Robot's video, he didn't judge them based on start biases and Please correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that either the settler that you get at the start of the game spawns in that area, or when you expand, that area is nearby. So pretty much it's always a guarantee. So for example, uh, let's see. In my footage for Brazil, for example, if you go to Brazil, you'll see that my capital isn't actually in the jungle, but one city south is where the jungle was. I'm pretty sure it's like that for everything. If you are Japan and you don't spawn on the coast, the coast isn't too far. So I do take the <clears throat> start biases into account for how to rank these sieves. I'll go ahead and give some of my thoughts, uh, my critiques for some of these things real quick. I guess the first thing that even I was dissatisfied with was the victory types, uh, how I judged those. I gave 5 out of 5 points for each victory type, and I don't know if I really agree with that because the victory types are not necessarily all treated the same. Um, I would say in general, the most applicable victory types to get in order are war, and then science, and then 
maybe culture and then diplomacy. Uh, I think that's probably the from easiest to hardest. And I really think, in general, if you can win war, you can probably win any of the victory types, right? If, you, if you're able to win war, that means you're probably ahead of your opponents in every single other aspect, because that's kind of what war measures. So I think giving five out of five points may have really not been right. It may have given some po uh, some sieves too little points and some sieves too many points. Uh, for example, let's see here. Hmm. I said this in the video. It might be controversial to rank Austria higher than India. I think India is pretty good. I think India maybe should be B uh, A tier. I don't really know. Um, the Zulus might also be A tier. Uh, they're often pretty good sieves. It, I have the Zulus being worse than Siam and Greece. Uh, some people may not agree with me on that. I have Ethiopia, the Huns, England, Arabia, and Shoshone being better than Persia. Some people not, might not agree with me with that. Uh, and I do think the victory types, there probably is some leeway. I didn't really know the best way to do it, though. I, I personally think that war is the easiest and the most defining of the victory types. And then, coincidentally, if you can win a culture victory, or a diplom especially with a diplomacy, if you could win a diplomacy victory, then you could have won a science victory. So science victory is just more simple in that point. Um, there's few situations where a culture victory is much more essential than a science victory, I find. Uh, let's see here. Another thing that I struggled with was trying to explain what adaptability and impact was. Uh, I wrote the script for most of the sieves before I wrote the very first paragraph where I kind of go over these questions. Uh, I, I started in the video, I called, like, I said this several times, and then I realized that I need to redo the first paragraph, so I restarted. I called it adaptability, versatility, blah, blah, blah. What I tried to mean by that is if you're screwed over by your lands or you can't get wonders or if you're behind or whatever, if bad stuff happens to you, I thought of just a lot of generic bad stuff that happens in this game, is the sieve able to overcome that bad stuff? I didn't really look at how many ways they're able to overcome it, but just is there an option that they can overcome it with? And the more reliable that option is, the better. Um... I kind of looked at it as, if they're on par, how good is the option or options they have to put them ahead of the pack outside of the normal playstyle? Because normally, what you want to do is you want to like get science buildings, like universities, blah, 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 work the specialist. If you can settle a mountain, blah, 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 get that. You want to grow your population. You want to get wonders like Temple of Artemis, blah, blah, blah. And the early game, you want to get a lot of growth so that way when factories and ideologies roll around, you can take advantage of the massive production. Typically, you can do a couple things. You can, I don't know, you can ally city-states and then force world ideology down everyone's throat. And then, since everyone's the same ideology, there isn't... Or, if everyone's going to eventually conform to world ideology, there isn't, like, that much war going on. You don't need to make a military. You could just make a military and kill your enemies. Something of the sorts. Uh, let's see. For example, the Zulu. If the Zulu have bad land or whatever... They have a very reliable way to get out of that Badlands scenario, which is the impies. The impies is their only way. So if it's detrimental to build impies, if it's not worth it or whatever, the Zulus are a little bit boned, right? They have to think of something else. The Zulus, their way to get out of a bad scenario is they have to adapt via war, and they ideally do it in the medieval era. So I think it really makes them not that customizable. They don't really have a lot of options. And then the single option they have is good. And then compared to someone like the Maya, who I called the most versatile sieve in the game, uh, shared with Poland, I think they're one of the two sieves that got 20 out of 20. If the Maya's behind, there's a ton of different stuff they can do. They can go to theology, and that's impactful. They could um, just kind of play the game. They can go really wide and get a bunch of pyramids. That's impactful. They can get a strong religion. That's impactful. All of these are very relevant. It gives them tons of options. So I think earlier... When I started talking about this, I said I'm not necessarily concerned with how many options they have, but just how impactful is their most impactful way to adapt to the environment. Um, consequently, a single sieve with a really good way to combat the environment, but like Babylon, right? Babylon just 
Babylon can get the free scientist, and that's it. Like, all Babylon has to do is get the free scientist, and it really just does a lot for them, right? Whereas the Maya can do a ton of different things, and that's how they're adaptable. And then, as for impact, actually, when I was first making this video, I called it Best Style of Play. And as I was going through the video, I actually didn't change it. I went back and I changed everyone's script, and I actually had to redo almost all the video. Uh, when I was writing Poland's script, and as you know, Poland was the last one, or it was like the Ottomans or something. One of those last two is when I changed it from best style of play to impact. And I think the whole time when I was talking about best style of play, that's what I meant. But really, what I meant with best style of play was, I guess, in the best case scenario, uh, if everything falls together, what what does the sieve do? And a lot of the times when I would specifically mention this, I would mention like they're specifically wide, they're specifically tall, and there's remnants of that in the script in the video. I think um, a lot of the times after I describe impact, I immediately mention wide or tall or turtling or warring or whatever. Uh, impact and adaptability seem a bit ambiguous to me, and I kind of don't like it for that. Um, I really like clear cut and dry ways to measure these sieves, and if they're ambiguous, I personally don't really think that um, it's a good way to justify measuring them. But a lot of the times when people do uh, tier lists, like like Banny, right? Banny and Team Fortress 2, he did a tier list for all of the weapons, like, I don't know, a couple months ago or whatever. I'm recording this on January 11th, 2021. Uh, Banny did a weapons tier list or whatever, and he just, he just gave some thoughts. Even, like, on the fly, he decided what tier they were in. I really don't like that. I think it's um a bit more attractive of... A video to watch if it's really systematic right if you could clearly measure how good it is but then the downside comes to with how do you measure it right uh sorry if you can hear the noise and the fidgeting with stuff and i know i shouldn't be and then another thing in the video was i said impactfulness is relative to all the other sieves so the avid listener may have the avid listener may have noticed that at most a single 10 out of 10, 9 out of 10, whatever, has at most five sieves associated with it for impact. Each one is scaled accordingly. So I'll go over all those really quick. For 10 out of 10 impact, I have Babylon, Korea, Spain, Poland, Mongolia. So it might be a little bit weird, like why is Spain and Mongolia there, right? They're not necessarily good sieves. So this is why I think impact may be a flawed way to describe this, but just in the best case scenario, and consistently, how reliably is that best case scenario? How much of a game-changing menace? How much does it completely change the state of the game? How much does it force other players to use their adaptability skill, right? If that makes any sense, right? Mongolia has some of the best war synergy in the game with the Camel Archers and the Ke or with the Keshiks and the Khan, not the Camel Archers. Right, Mongolia is a force to be reckoned with, right? Like, if Mongolia is warring, it's non-stop. The civs, they, the civs have to completely just change everything they do, else, excuse me, else they probably won't win. Even with the Great Wall, I, I didn't show this in the footage, but in Mongolia, I had killed someone with the Great Wall in my game, and even with the Great Wall and the military, blah, 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 they still couldn't stop me. Like, you have to put all of your resources into killing Mongolia if they get rolling. Um, and a lot of the sieves, when I first made this, I had a bunch of sieves on 10 out of 10 for impact, and then when I decided to make it relative, I had to distribute it. So Arabia was originally up there, but I moved Arabia down, and I think Russia was in 10 out of 10 impact, and I had to move her down to make it relative. So anyways, 10 out of 10 is Babylon, Korea, Spain, Poland, Mongolia, 9 out of 10 is Arabia, Ethiopia, England, Inca, the Huns. 8 out of 10 is Egypt, Russia, Persia, Zulu, China. 7 out of 10 is Austria, Celts, India, Aztecs. 6 out of 10 is the Maya, the Greeks, Shoshone, and the Venetians. Uh, 5 out of 10 is Germany, Brazil, Byzantium, Rome. 4 out of 10 is Denmark, Siam, Sweden, America. 3 out of 10 is Assyria, Songhai, Netherlands, Carthage. 2 out of 10 is Indonesia, Iroquois, Morocco, France, and 1 out of 10 is Japan, Polynesia, Portugal, Ottomans. So, because there's 43 sieves in the game, when you divide that by 10, that's 
so the way it is is that for each of these 10 categories, so 10 out of 10, 9 out of 10, I keep saying that, for each of these 10, there's going to be three categories with five, and then the rest of them are going to have four in them. So my three categories with five are 10, 9, and 8. Those are the ones with five sieve, and then all the other groups have four sieves. So for example, for the amount of impact that it does, I describe Rome higher than Siam. Rome is 5 out of 10, Siam's 4 out of 10. And I think this is because while I said Rome was bad, if the Legion is a warring menace, if they have built roads all over, you know, one time I was in a game with Baba Yedu, I was Poland and he was Rome, and then Baba Yedu built roads across the whole continent before people settled their cities with the legions, and then he just mobilized his army, and, it was, and I wasn't ready, and he completely stopped me, right? Rome is a lot more impactful than Siam that way. Siam, you know, Siam has the nice knight. It comes out later than the Rome, than the Roman uh, swordsman. And then Siam also, if they have city-state allies, the AI can just buy the city-states away, right? Uh, I think it's less impactful because of that. There's a ways to countermeasure it, right? Uh, let's see here. Austria, I have 7 out of 10. If Austria buys a city-state, like, that's it. You need to act fast if Austria is going to buy a city-state. So I really think that's why it's very impactful compared to Assyria with 3 out of 10. Uh, the siege towers, they can get rolling. They're Sorry, I just bumped the mic. The siege towers, they can get rolling with Assyria. They're pretty impactful. Um, definitely, I think, they change the state of the game. They have the potential to change the state of the game more than Austria. A lot less reliably so. Um, they're pretty easy to defeat, right? Like, maybe not with a range attack. They have cover and all that. But if you can get a swordsman, blah, 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 whatever, it's much easier to stop a siege tower than it is to stop Austria from marrying a city-state. Anyways, that's try kind of me trying to explain impact. And then let me just go over this list real quick and see if I have any qualms, anything that's weird. I think the biggest thing that's weird is Austria is really high. A lot of people don't think Austria is that good. I really disagree. I think Austria is really good. I just, the experience I had playing Austria is really good. The Netherlands was given a 10 out of 10 for miscellaneous. Um, that might be too much, right? Maybe I should take away those points. The Netherlands consistently really are not that good. And I miscellaneous is a hard way to judge. I didn't really have a word for just if a sieve was good, but the other criteria didn't show it, I would put it in miscellaneous. Or if there's just more than I need to talk about. A lot of times with miscellaneous, I talk about fun little strategies and gimmicks you can do that completely change the state of the game. So like with Morocco, their miscellaneous, I mention that it's because the Casba and Petra are really powerful. That's not the only reason why, just for the sake of the video, that's what I describe. But most miscellaneouses are like that. Um, the Netherlands, maybe they shouldn't have a 10 out of 10 for miscellaneous, but I found that they really don't compare to the D-tier civs. The Netherlands is way better than Morocco, uh, way better than Polynesia and Assyria. I, I had to put them in C-tier. Brazil, I think, could be higher. Uh, I think the Brazil wood camps do a lot more than what I said for them. But I don't really see Brazil being better than Denmark or the Netherlands, for example. Brazil maybe is better than Venice. And also, Venice was a really hard one to judge um, because it's really hard to figure out how good the AI is killing Venice because if the, the, you need some data of the AI killing Venice, uh, I don't know how often the, in the game I had as Venice, um, I bought a city state on a continent that Shaka was on and then Shaka killed my city state and raised it. Right. But I was on a different continent, so he didn't come over and kill me. Right. I think if I was neighboring Shaka, he could have easily killed me and I would have lost, but I don't really have the data to represent that. So it was kind of a guesstimate. Um, let's see, originally, in fact, let me, I have a, um, an original tier list that I'll go ahead and pop up real quick. Uh, some things I changed, Byzantium moved down quite a bit. Uh, most civs, they changed by one or two points, whatever. Uh, like, the Inca stayed the same, but the Maya moved up. Uh, let's see, Byzantium moved from 40 points to 31 points. Uh... Rome moved up two points, and Carthage moved down two, and the Iroquois moved down two. I actually ranked the Iroquois better than the Ottomans and Japan, but now they're just ranked just as well as Japan. Uh, let's see, I moved Mongolia up quite a few points, because originally I had them at 31, but I feel like they didn't really represent how well they were. And I think that's it for kind of like the biggest changes. 
But yeah, I'll, I'll flash this on screen. If you agree with this more, let me know. Um, I also moved Indonesia down. I thought like I was really generous with Indonesia, and I don't really think Indonesia is that good. Um, I remember I gave Indonesia a five out of five for science. I hope that's not controversial, right? Um, I just think that they can get way more faith. So if they just bulb great scientists, it's, it's so many more texts than most people. They can get like four or five, probably not five. They can get like three or four more great scientists than you normally would because they get absurd amounts of faith. Especially in this game, the computer, they love to spread their faith to your cities. They love to overwhelm the world with their faith. Um, let's see, I don't really have anything else to critique. I'm going to upload a spreadsheet that has all of the stats side by side. If you notice any errors in this video or in the stats, please let me know. And I'll see if I can make an edit. I hope that what I said is the same numbers that appeared on screen. This video is really long, so it's so much data that I'm sure I've glossed over something, but hopefully it's not wrong. I've revised this video like a million times. Please let me know what you think. And if you think there's a better way to judge these sieves, uh, leave a comment. Thank you.